Welcome to For Your Amusement, a theme park podcast that aims to exhaustively evaluate the world's most popular theme park attractions to determine if they are world class. I'm Ryan Vergara. I'm Byron Marin. And for this episode's featured attraction, we had to look, didn't we, at Indiana Jones Adventure in Disneyland, California. And joining us in the angry gaze of a tourist hating Dr. Jones is theme park journalist Scott Gustin. Uh, thank you for joining us, Scott. And as always, go ahead and like and subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube.com slash watch your podcast or subscribe and rate the podcast five stars if you're just listening. And hey, tell a friend. It helps keep us going here and keep this show alive. But once again, thank you for joining us, Scott. Yeah, thanks for having me. Joining us in the Tiki Room. Uh, for those of you who aren't watching the video version of this, I have come in full cosplay as Indiana Jones. Um, I, I, there's that, there's really nothing for me to add beyond that. It, it's a little embarrassing. I'd expect nothing less. We are recording a theme park podcast. <laughs> so <laughs> I think I threw all that out the door. Scott, why did you pick this attraction? So I first went to Disneyland. It was like 10 years ago. And I just won't forget the feeling of riding that attraction. I had heard all the, the hype for it. But entering that main room on that attraction. The glory was hole. Like, yeah, it was like a a light went off where I was opened up to a whole other level of expectations for a a theme park ride. That was just that immersive, like overwhelming emotional feeling. And that is still one of my favorite moments to have that wow moment in a theme park. Even new attractions, Rise of the Resistance kind of have that same feeling, but that one's still at the top where I was just like, this, this is the way you're supposed to feel. Like when you see something, you're supposed to not understand how you are in this world. So it's it's incredible. And for those of you who who don't know Scott's work, he he's pretty much at the at the forefront of the battle here in terms of keeping us all up to date on anything theme park related. Uh, he's kind of my number one go to source for any kind of breaking news. Scott, how long have you been doing this? Were you always in the theme parks, or was that something that Indiana Jones kind of turned you on to? Uh, no, I've always loved like going to going to the parks. Uh, we went to Walt Disney World a bunch when I was a kid, and then it really picked up for me in college, going a lot. And then my real job is is being a journalist at a, a news organization. But I kind of found a path for what I saw as some needed uh, hard news during the closure for COVID. Yes, and so I was trying to just get facts out because people were speculating about a lot of stuff at the parks. And so I started to kind of go all in on trying to be a a reliable truth based source. Yeah, for that's appreciated. All of the, like the fire hose of, of news that was coming out during that period, and then you know just kind of try to keep it going with all of the news that then followed as they closed every little thing and then started to reopen every little thing and then things were not the way they were before and then. They threw Genie Plus at everyone. They certainly Um, did throw it at us. Maybe one of the top worst things to come out of COVID was was that. Uh, So a lot of things going on there. So Reservation system, too. You can make an argument for that. Pretty rough. Yeah, that's true. Gosh, man. I I, I try to block that out. Walt Disney World's moving away from it. But yeah, Disneyland, it seems they're just going to keep going with those awful parkers. I'll tell you what. They got us where they want us. Yeah, they they (laughs) They certainly have blocked me out several times from my own past (laughs) in that I can't get a reservation for a lot of the days I want. Uh, But, you know, it is kind of what it is, I suppose. I don't know if you're familiar with NBA Twitter, but you're to me kind of like the the, Woj, right? You're like theme park Twitter's version of Adrian (laughs) Wojnarowski or Sham Sharania. Anytime I I see something from you, I know for sure it actually is happening. And I'm like, okay, there's a bomb being dropped right there. That's pretty cool. I had someone at Disney tell me the same comparison with Adam Schefter. And oh, so, yeah, you're like Shefty like, as well. I know Shefty better than Woj, but I, I'm very familiar with... Um, Woj has some crazy bombs. Like, Schefter is just kind of like little here and there. Woj is like earth-shaking news that he'll just drop, and you are just you have to stop everything you're doing and go look at it. That's kind of how I feel about your tweets. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> oh, the, I got to stop everything and go read this report. For the sickos out there. If it's, all uh, the theme park sickos, you are yeah. our Woj. Anyways, uh, let's move into the, some history here and let's get right into it, Byron. June 12th, 1981, the George Lucas Steven Spielberg action adventure film Raiders of the Lost Ark is released, earning critical praise and becoming the highest grossing film of that year. 
The film was anchored by Harrison Ford, who brought to life the iconic bullwhip cracking, fedora wearing, ass kicking, adventure seeking archaeologist by the name of Indiana Jones. In 1984, Michael Eisner and Frank Wells are brought on to lead the Walt Disney Company to greener pastures after barely surviving multiple hostile takeover attempts. To the surprise of many of the Imagineers at the time, Eisner was keen on pumping more resources into WED Enterprises, which he would change to Walt Disney Imagineering, and breathing new life into the theme parks. And thanks to his experience working at Paramount Pictures prior to coming to Disney, Eisner had already established a good working relationship with George Lucas, which helped convince him to take a tour of Disney's Imagineering facilities. This would lead to what would become a very fruitful collaboration with Lucas and Disney. January 9th, 1987, Star Tours opens at Disneyland Park. The project was spearheaded by Disney legendary Imagineer Tony Baxter, who along with his team and Lucas introduced a state-of-the-art motion simulator ride system, which took guests on a journey through the iconic galaxy far, far away. The overwhelming success of Star Tours, in addition to the Lucas-produced Captain EO short film that was screening at both Disneyland and Epcot, would inspire then-Disney CEO Michael Eisner to keep the ball rolling with George Lucas when it came to new exciting park attractions. This would naturally lead Eisner and creative to shift focus towards George Lucas's other highly successful Harrison Ford starring film franchise, Indiana Jones, a film which Eisner himself played a role in greenlighting back when he was at Paramount. Was this the first entry into Stevie Spielberg into Disney properties? I mean, yes and no. Steven Spielberg directed the film. He worked with George Lucas on it. However, I don't believe Steven Spielberg himself was involved with the Indiana Jones attraction. Interesting. Yeah. I always thought he was more like a a direct uh, collaboration with Lucasfilm. But then again, there might have been a conflict of interest at that time because he was was already working at Universal. So I think it was more specifically George Lucas and then Star Tours being like the first attraction that was non Disney IP. To come to a Disney park. Hostile takeovers. I had no idea about those. I'm imagining like, like you're talking about like in the terms of like succession. There wasn't anybody, you know, breaking out the fisticuffs over in well, Burbank. Be, like people like buying out shares and trying to take over the, it was like it happened multiple times. I bet you like I mean, a, a docu-series or just a scripted series about mm-hmm. the corporate culture of Disney would be incredible. Yeah. Because I'm like, reading Disney's land right now and some of the stuff of the building of Disneyland is even funny. Michael Eisner. What a guy. What a guy. If you want to read on it, the, the Disney War book by James Stewart talks about this. It is a fascinating story that also feels familiar with what's going on at Disney right now. And I think there are some people writing a book about what's happening right now that will essentially be the sequel. You talking about like the, 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 the proxy battle? Yeah, yeah. Out. And just the Chapek Iger battle. Hilarious. Uh, You know, like all of that, there's a a writer at the Wall Street Journal that is um, essentially writing what I what I would expect. And I think many expect to be like a a sequel to that that book, which was about Iser and Iger. So, huh, I'm going to check that out. I would pay a lot of money to listen to an audio book of Eisner reading that to me. Oh, dude, he would be so salty, too. (laughs) Okay, Byron, let's continue here. So this takes us to August 25th, 1989. The Indiana Jones Epic Stunt Spectacular Show would debut at Disney's MGM Studios just three months after the opening of that park. The innovative and creative stunt show based on the hit franchise was met with early praise and popularity, giving audiences a chance to see the iconic moments from the film reenacted live, such as Indy escaping the big rolling boulder. success of Indiana Jones Stunt Spectacular would inspire Lucas and the Imagineers to bring an Indiana Jones experience to the West Coast, but this time they really wanted to put guests into the action. Original concepts for the Indiana Jones experience were mocked up as being more than a ride, but an entire complex dedicated to the franchise. Going by the working title Indiana Jones and the Lost Expedition, the project would have required an entire overhaul of Adventureland and housed multiple rides including a minecar roller coaster inspired by the famous chase sequence from the Temple of Doom film. Which eventually went to Paris. Well, they did do like a minecar looking Indiana Jones ride there, and then even at Disney Sea. They did a clone of that 
Although I don't believe it's actually called Indiana Jones. You've so. been on the roller coaster in Paris, right? That I've been on both. Yeah, they're the, the same. Sucks. Paris and Tokyo Disney. <laughs> it's not City. a good ride. They're, they're they're jerkers. Let's just say that. Well, you could say and, it differently. And not in the way that you like, but you know, they're <laughs> jerkers nonetheless. <laughs> Anyways, continue. This massive complex was even rumored to include the pre-existing jungle cruise, providing yet another layer of kinetic energy to what would have obviously been a highly immersive Indiana Jones experience. However, the financial failure of the recently opened Euro Disney Park would result in company-wide budget cuts and these ridiculously lofty dreams of a massive lost expedition complex would die. Sort of, because an Indiana Jones dark ride was still greenlit for Disneyland. I didn't realize how many casualties came at the hands of Euro Disneyland. Just so many different projects that were supposed to be incredible. Wasn't well, that what fucked California Adventure too? It did. Yeah, I mean, that was like when they were cooking up like Westcott. There was even like concepts oh, yeah, of- Westcott. They're, they're like, originally the concept for Disney Sea was supposed to happen like in Long Beach. Maybe it's for the best Westcott didn't happen. It would have been humiliating when our ball would be smaller than theirs. Everything about them is fucking bigger. It's so annoying. People have told me that the effects are still felt today because Disney as a company introduced so many like checks on um, creative and like how long projects take because Ooh, they, want to, they want to draw things out to make sure that they'll last, especially in Florida. Like they just are so slow to... to bring characters or bring anything it feels at times and it's a lot of people trace it back to that because with Euro Disney it was kind of like go 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 let's go quick um and they just were like all right we gotta we gotta go slow we gotta make sure that things are gonna you know that our research is right that things are gonna work and and we know how slow Disney is now no, oh, they move at a glacial pace. Is that why it's taking them forever to make Tiana's or like, and meanwhile, Universal's building an entire whole ass theme park? I mean, it's not the reason, uh, but I've had people really tell me that it, it is part of it. It's kind of like it introduced the acceptance of moving at such a slow pace. I think a lot of, a lot right now is just because the, there's no money. Yeah. But anyways, a, uh, an Indiana Jones dark ride is still greenlit for Disneyland, even though it's not the entire massive complex. It's actually similar to like when Space Mountain was first cooked up. Those early spaceport concept arts actually like had like, I think even more than two tracks. So I think they just start like really big as well and then they scale down. They will then, and, yeah. Um, but we, you know, they still green light an Indiana Jones highly immersive dark ride attraction. Um, but this came with a heavy challenge, being that Imagineers needed to find a way to increase the size of Adventureland by about 33% in order to fit what would become at the time the largest attraction at Disneyland Park. In August of 1993, construction begins on the new attraction, and Tony Baxter, still fresh off the success of Star Tours, takes leadership of this project with the help of about 400 other Imagineers and construction workers. The 50,000 square foot show building is cleverly tucked roughly half a mile behind the footpaths of Adventureland and disguised as a massive temple in order to serve as an immersive queue that unbeknownst to park guests, takes them under the Disneyland Railroad to essentially the outside of the park. This building would take over where the Eeyore parking lot once stood and require the monorail to be rerouted. As well as the Jungle Cruise. And the Jungle Cruise. Which is yeah. interesting because that early concept art of having the Jungle Cruise go through the show building probably was accounting for that to just be the case. And then when they realized, uh-oh, Mikey spent all of our checks, I guess we're going to have to just reroute the river. And what also ticks me off, by the way, Scott, is Disney World, for you people on the East Coast, does have an indoor portion of Jungle Cruise. We almost had like a bunch of it in there, and yet Magic Kingdom's the one that actually got an in indoor portion. We beefed it. We beefed it. Which is my favorite part of that Jungle Cruise. It's, it is, is my favorite part, too. Like, it's, it's, the, it's the moment where also, like, kids, like, are suddenly a little scared, which you need a little bit on those rides when you're young. Like, you need to feel a little unsure. And every time, mine are kind of like, what, what is happening? Why are we going in here? And yeah, when we did it at Disneyland, it was just a completely different feel. You don't have that feeling of, like, uncertainty like you do. Um, you go in that 
Yeah, I don't have kids like you, Scott, but I think it's a good thing to terrify children. I think you should scare them scare it, them really it builds, early. It builds character. Yeah. It does build character. Anyways, so while this stuff is being rerouted, the Imagineers at the time are also hard at work up in Glendale, coming up with what was at the time a completely new ride vehicle system, which was called an Enhanced Motion Vehicle, or EMV for short. These EMVs were designed to resemble troop transportation vehicles capable of handling rough and rugged terrain. Each vehicle would feature its own full motion chassis, aka literal motion simulators, that performed on top of a set of four functioning tires. These vehicles would be successfully guided and charged by a rail that runs below the surface of a slotted roadbed that mimicked the ride's layout. Which, by the way, that little that little slot that they had, the little, I guess, the pole that goes into the slot, making it basically into a giant slot car, isn't it very much like Operation, where if the if the the rail actually touches any of like the slot, the ride just automatically stops. Does that happen? Is that like a part of why it breaks? It's if, it's there as a safeguard. When they built this, like the amount of like work they put into the sensors, and that there's so many like fail safes. That's why the ride is why it resets broken. so often. Yeah, because any little thing is you got to do what you got to do. I mean, it's the first of its kind to not add more skeletons. And they're still and they're still working on it. Yeah. <laughs> so March third, nineteen ninety five. Indiana Jones, Temple of the Forbidden Eye officially premieres with Michael Eisner and various celebrities in attendance and opens publicly the following day. Sponsored by AT&T at the time, the attraction went the extra mile while handing out decoder cards to every guest upon entry. This practice, along with the AT&T sponsorship, are no longer with us. However, you can still apparently request decoder cards from cast members they actually have video of that like opening of indiana jones on youtube and it serves as a very funny time capsule of who was famous at that time i, th I think from my recollection it was like jonathan taylor thomas was on there oh because he did like the little promo right yeah well he was like the disney boy it's a temple of the forbidden eye we could be in for untold riches and of course arnold Death in the EMV. That was fabulous. Gotta love it. Like Dan Aykroyd was there. Dan Aykroyd probably was there hunting for ghosts. That guy's got some issues, and I know that coming from me. It was pretty, pretty cool to see, you know, Tony Danza, Wayne Gretzky, just like Tony Danza <laughs> and yeah, Wayne. Was just, just funny. Like it's just a different time. Someone was like, you know what? We need Wayne Gretzky to be here. Well, no, was dude, that, you miss 100% of the shots you don't the, take. Uh, <laughs> Wayne Gretzky, Michael, Michael Scott. Exactly. Anyways, fast forward to September 4th, 2001. Tokyo Disney Sea opens, and with that comes their own version of Indiana Jones Adventure. Although the layout was essentially a duplicate of Disneyland's, the story would revolve around the Crystal Skull, which was actually many years before that film came out. Oof. Um, and be thematically located in South America to fit more adequately within the Lost River Delta area of that park. Disneyland's version has been um, entertaining riders ever since, as well as Tokyo Disney Seas. The Disneyland version did experience refurbishments in 2012 and recently in 2023, and still to this day remains one of the most popular attractions in the park, sporting an all-time average wait time of... I'm going to go with 45 minutes. That's going to be my guess for an average wait time all time. That might be low. I'll go 55. Ah, oh, damn. That already sounds more correct. I would have initially gone with Scott's answer, but it actually is 44 minutes according oh, to thrilldata.com. Damn, dude. That's what happens when you show up to set dressed as Indiana Jones. You Which is be interesting wrong. because I you got rarely. The wrong hat on. Cause this, <laughs> yeah, because this is all time average, but I feel like in recent years, especially. Like, I'm wondering that, like, d during the 90s, there, like, just reached a point where there wasn't as much yeah. attendance as there is now. Because I feel like it's rare that you see this thing under, you no, know, 45 minutes. That's today. also because I also wonder, this ride breaks down so often, and I think they automatically put it up at 45 once it comes back on. So I wonder if it's just the little... Ticker, they do, like, a preemptive... The ticker thing there is like, all right, we're always at 45. It's spent half of its time down. So it really that does. Has to, that has to skew the average. <laughs> Although I gotta say, I th I don't know if this is the same at Disney World. Scott, I have a smaller sample size over there, but I've actually lately been timing when I get in the standby queue and comparing it to the ride wait times. And oh, Byron has a conspiracy theory here. Yeah, which I, and I, I don't like to go down this route, but man, like it is really, it keeps proving itself time and time again. If anyone, like, last time like I went on Indian, it was like 45 minutes. I got on in like 15, maybe. 
It was like 10 to 15 minutes where it's almost at a point where it's realizing like, even if the park isn't insanely crowded on a day to motivate a genie plus purchase, there it is. Wouldn't it make sense to round up? Look, Scott, I hope that's not the case. Scott is not a merchant of conspiracy. He's a merchant of truth. And you can't be saying stuff like Disney artificially inflates the wait times on genie plus attractions that you have to pay an extra $20 to get on. But I will say granted to say like, this is, not fact. This is me being probably just bitter. No, but, but I have seen them put like Mind Train over at Magic Kingdom at like forty five minutes, and it's like a ten minute wait. But it really does motivate you to buy that that Genie Plus. I mean, it, Disney's Disney was inflating uh, wait times before Genie Plus. There it is. Um, so it's not just Genie Plus, but what Genie Plus has done is add more uncertainty to the standby queue. So they have to factor in more uncertainty to how long a guest will, will wait. Uh, Disney's goal is not to tell you how long you're going to wait. It's like the maximum amount of time. And for a lot of rides, they factor in like an extra few cycles of the ride. Should it go down? Like there, there's a lot that they put into it, but they want you to walk off happy you only had to wait 15 when it told you 45. Under promise, over deliver. I've often walked off attractions being like, that wasn't 40. I got out there in 15. But yeah, the thing is, you are you are stoked about it. I will say, I see this theory and I don't believe it, uh, with specifically about Genie Plus, with the exception of Runaway Railway when it opened at Disneyland and it was the individual attraction um sales where you buy just that right it wasn't part of genie plus it was just like you you buy it and i mean we were there when <laughs> there was no one in the queue they were posting a 40 minute wait or you <laughs> yeah. buy the 20 dollar individual lightning lane like i we walked through the queue oh, um, man. so like that's where i will put on my tinfoil hat for a moment uh and and say that there's a possibility it's factoring in there but they're, they're just shooting fish in a barrel at that point though like if there's like a family from out of state they don't know anything they buy this ticket to get in faster because they think they're doing the right thing then they walk in and no one's inside the building that's that's trash can tipping material i'm going out in toontown and i'm making a ruckus i'm fighting yeah. goofy i, I wouldn't bet. fight goofy i'd i'd fight donald i could i could take donald i think it was pluto that chased someone around uh someone like pulled the back of his costume and he chased him around Disneyland. Was that know. real or was that a, a bit? Oh, that, oh no, that wasn't a bit. That's, that's real. Someone, oh, Pluto was heated. So don't fight Goofy. If you fight Pluto, he might fight back. Well, Pluto um, doesn't even know what, uh, Goofy doesn't even know what he is. What, we're not going to get into who's a dog, what's a dog kind of thing, but you know, anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, does that do it for the history? That wraps part? up the history. If you have anything to add, Scott, by all means. I uh, love to hear it. No, no I'm, I learned a lot there. Uh, let's move on to some fun facts. But before we do that, let's have a word uh, from our sponsors. And we're back. Hope we had some sponsors. That would be incredibly embarrassing. Uh, let's move on to fun facts. Now, Scott, this is, this, these aren't your type of facts. These are fun ones in the sense that some of them may or may not be true. And I, <laughs> and I will point out when I do think that they're a little, eh, I don't know about this one. Uh, but hey, I got these from the internet, and the internet never lies. Do we get to decide which ones are real or not? Or are you, we hoping no. that they're all correct? As far as I know, most of these are correct. <laughs> okay, the the ones, I don't believe there's any in this one that I'm like, I don't know about this. But, you know, if there is one where I'm like, I haven't really seen this for myself, but here's what people say, I will, put, I will point that out. And then point them to Snopes.com. Exactly. <laughs> uh, the ride length is approximately 3 minutes and 25 seconds. That obviously depends on dispatch and all that stuff with a top speed of just over 14 miles per hour and a ride capacity of roughly 2,400 riders per hour, which was pretty high for the time, uh, with an estimated cost of $50 million, according to the LA Times, which puts it at a little over $104 million by today's standards. I have seen some people online say that it's $100 million, but I'm going to trust the LA Times more so. LA Times did like a whole write-up on this, where they actually were invited early to, to go see Indiana Jones, among other press members, about two months early. And that was actually very different from how Disney would do business. Uh, Disney was usually very, very secretive. Uh, actually, in this LA Times interview, legendary Imagineer Tony Baxter, when asked why Disney deviated from their normal secrecy by giving the press a two-month early preview of the ride, he said, 
they wanted people to know before opening that, quote, this is not just another ride. So he was feeling himself already. He knew they had a fastball loaded in the chamber and they couldn't wait to just unload this thing. So uh, this is probably like the first instance of Disney kind of figuring out they could generate hype for attractions by giving little, little snippets as opposed to just putting everything in the mystery box. The show building, as Byron mentioned earlier, is actually 60,000 square feet. Oh, shit. Not 50. Where'd you get 50? I don't know. That might have also just been in the, like, like just when they were planning it. And maybe, maybe it got bigger. I just wish both of us were committed to research. Um, <laughs> where, where did you get your 60? I got 60 from the LA Times. You ever heard of it? Los Angeles Times. I don't have a subscription. It's too expensive. Maybe there's one that included the Jungle Cruise uh, right through. That was That's true. Through one Maybe. Two, so. I appreciate the olive branch that you're offering here, Scott, and I'm going to snap it in <laughs> half because it's 60,000 square feet. Uh, speaking of that show building, uh, Byron already mentioned this. The reason why the queue for this attraction is so massive is because the show building was so massive and they had to displace it from, from Adventureland in the Eeyore parking lot. And you're actually walking underneath the railroad Actually, half a mile is how much you're walking, it's winding crazy. through those tunnels uh, of the queue. And also to commemorate the dearly departed Eeyore parking lot, there's an actual Eeyore parking sign up on the scaffolding above the projector in the projection room in the queue. If you walk to the front of the room and turn around, you can see this sign. It's pretty hard to see. You might have to ask like a, a cast member just trying to flashlight on it. They'll usually do it if you ask. It's fun. Love seeing our little sad donkey up there. The ride vehicles, as Byron mentioned, are highly unique and each vehicle has its own ride system with thousands of programmed movements that defer ride to ride. In fact, according to Tony Baxter, when this ride opened, Baxter claimed it had 27 different variations of the ride, not just with the rotating chambers of youth, riches, or future, but also the events that happened during the ride as well as the ride movements. And since then, these independent ride systems have nearly 160,000 possible show combinations, which means this ride is, unless you ride it that many times, going to be minutely different every single time. This is kind of the beginning of Disney being like, it's going to be a choose your own adventure kind of thing, you know, like they do with Guardians and stuff like that. But in this case, it's much more minute. We're talking about like the micro expressions of the vehicle moving in a certain different way or Indy saying d different lines or certain effects going on or off. It's it's interesting. I've never really felt that going on this ride, TBH. Well, because it feels so random and like it's one of the few rides that you've, it's kind of hard to like anticipate every movement no matter how many times you've been on it no no for sure funny aside from that la times interview by the way the reporter cited indy uh the indiana jones attraction that is as disney trying to combat the quote skittering attention span of the mtv generation end quote which is just kind of shows you every generation is get off my lawn about the other generation i hear so many fucking millennials be like oh gen z can't pay attention to anything. They can't read cursive. <laughs> and this is basically what boomers were calling us, the MTV generation, which I completely forgot about. And, and this is probably why we got Videopolis, baby. Well, I mean, yeah, that's probably true because Eisner was like, let's lean into the MTV generation. And it really, I guess, just all comes down to like some suits in like a boardroom pointing at some sort of chart, trying to figure out what the youth like. And there's no youth around them. Disney Quest, they'll love it. Actually, I kind of like Disney Quest. I, as a kid, I actually did like <laughs> I did think I would rather be in Disney World, but if I can't get into Disney World, I'll go to Disney Quest and ride some shitty motion. Well, that scenery. was because they had that cyberspace mountain where you got to like design your own roller coaster. Oh, yeah. You were... like The simulator actually would go upside down. So no, you were was... probably creaming your little pants doing that. <laughs> My... <laughs> Never mind. <I'm> not even... <laughs> the Imagineers held out hope that Harrison Ford would lend his voice to this attraction. He did not, <laughs> as Harrison Ford often does. He's portrayed by Dave Temple, a voice actor. Uh, and as far as I know, his likeness is just off, just a little bit to make it okay. I just think that's hilarious. Ain't that like grumpy old man Harrison Ford to be like, hey, Harrison, you want to come be Indiana Jones for this amazing, innovative ride that we're building? <laughs> no. I, I could even imagine him just hanging up. <laughs> just nothing. Yeah, you get nothing. I think he would do it today. Like, Maybe I, he would. Yeah, I mean, it, you guys saw like how emotional he was, like when they revealed the trailer for the new movie. That's true. Like, like I guess that was it. I don't know if that was at Expo or where that was, but he just. I mean, we, we all do this as we get older, but I feel like he maybe has come around to it. But 
I think it would make me even more happy to know that he still would say no. Like he would just yeah. be like, hell no. Like, no, you're not going to make me into a robot. I'm, I'm not, I'm not doing that. <laughs> He's still a grumpy old man. There is that great quote from that. I think it was a variety article of him on the set of the new Avengers movie, or I think it's the new captain America movie, new world order or whatever. And Anthony Mackie said that he was so nervous around Harrison Ford that he forgot his lines and that Harrison Ford comforted him and was just like, blah, 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 it's fine. And then he was like, all right, let's shoot this piece of shit. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and Anthony Mackie, when he said the line, uh, he said Harrison Ford said, all right, let's shoot this shit. Kind of like, hey, let's do it. And then Harrison was like, no, no, no. I said, let's shoot this piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> And there's also that great clip of him telling David Blaine to get the fuck out of my house, which is imagine. I imagine what he told Tony Baxter. Um, that is, I was literally going to say the same thing. That is what I imagine. So I'm coming in and talking to him about the ride. He just says, "Get the get, hell out of my house. Get the fuck out of my house, <laughs> or get off my plane." Another good one. Anyways, they didn't get Harrison Ford, but they did manage to snag British actor John Rhys Davies to reprise his role as Sala, at least in the flesh. Because uh, his voice is actually not John Reese Davies. It's bizarrely played by another actor, an American actor named Bob Joles. So when you see Sala on screen in the safety, vi- in the safety video, that's not his voice. Because if you recall, it slides. It's not him actually talking. They actually had another actor record the lines for him, but he agreed to be pictorially represented. Welcome, my friends, to the Temple of the Forbidden Eye. I, shall now give you counsel to seek out your miraculous journey. Now, I had never heard this before, so this may be one of those, I don't know if this is true, but it seems to be true. So chime off in the comments if you're like, hey, that's not accurate. But from what I found, it seems to be accurate. Did you know that, Scott? I, I did not. And never, ever would I have noticed. No, um, it sounds but, just like him. But it also sounds like something that, it sounds like something that is true because Disney has like done this where they don't want to pay a rate to someone exactly. in perpetuity for a ride. So they have to hire a voice actor, but that's, that's hilarious that they got him on screen, but they couldn't get, couldn't get his voice. That's hilarious. pretty sweet gig for John Reese Davies. He just goes over to the temple, takes a couple Polaroids and is like, all right, I'm going to fuck off now. And then like, yeah. the, and then the rest is probably just, ride the ride. Yeah. Probably. And then you guys could have someone else record all my lines and everyone will know, you know, be none the wiser. Uh, James Earl Jones, also probably the most famous voice actor featured in this ride, is the voice of Mara. For a brief moment, he was replaced by some other voice actor, and then Disney was like, uh-oh, and then went right back to James Earl Jones. If you're a fan of the uh, indie films, Raiders, the first one, the prop truck from that movie sits in the outdoor portion of the queue right by the entrance, um, and the truck actually has golf balls attached to the handlebars on the side of the truck that were used by the stuntmen to hang on to the moving car. You could still see that to this day. Uh, another featured prop in the uh, ride queue is from the Temple of Doom. The mine cart used in the chase at the end of the film is right by the exit of the, uh, of the attraction, which is really cool. I didn't know about that one. I knew about the truck. When the ride first opened, it was sponsored by AT&T, who handed out physical decoder cards, which were handed out to guests to decipher the fake alphabet-encoded messages on the walls of the queue. One neat detail was the glyph for the I, the letter I, looked noticeably different than all the other letters, and it was actually because it was a, an eyeball. You know, kind of fun little pun there. And uh, now you can actually read the stuff on the walls if you use the um, the Play Disney Parks app and wonder why we can't have nice things anymore because uh, it would be so much cooler to have these physical items, these decoder cards. But now can you can you still get if you ask a cast member? Can you? I heard that you could still get it if you ask people. I have not tried that, and I can't confirm that. You could I certainly either. ask. I'll try it this week, I guess. Yeah, but... try that. Try today, Byron, because you're going right after this. <laughs> uh, I'm so jealous. They believed in this attraction so much that they actually modified the entrance to Jungle Cruise to thematically match Indy as well as to accommodate more people that would probably be coming to Adventureland uh, in the rush. More than 1,300 props are apparently in this queue. The suspension bridge is 50 feet above the lava pit. The Mara skull in that glory hole room is 45 feet tall. The boulder is 16 feet in diameter. And the giant mechanical cobra is 100 feet long, which, by the way, is apparently one of 2,129 snakes in this attraction. Why did it have to be snakes, huh? <laughs> yeah, it had to be snakes. Uh, good. Indy, he hates snakes, for all you who don't know that. And uh, I do, because I'm dressed as Indy. 
There's apparently 55 murals throughout the attraction that tell the story of Mara, and all of them have Mara's eyes closed or covered, which is a nice little neat bit, uh, bit of storytelling there. Uh, my favorite one is actually the one on the ceiling in the well room, which is uh, you can actually see Mara overlooking the, the, the collapsing bridge right before you see the snake on the ceiling in that room. Beautiful. Or I also am partial to the one that you see right as you dispatch from the in the beginning of the ride. There's the one that has like the white tape over over the eyes that's in the loading zone. Iconic. Oh, yeah. It's kind of got like the little like does it have like almost like blood almost like behind the or like a red like paint behind where the eyeballs. No, are, but or... it, it is a statue. So you could see balls behind like the tape. Like you could yeah. see the shape of the balls. <laughs> Which you is good for me. Uh, <laughs> a ninety piece orchestra adapted the indie scores from the film to the score for this ride. The score for this attraction, a banger, undeniable banger. They featured it a little bit in the uh, uh, remember uh, remember fireworks show if you remember that. Huh. Uh, but also this score, I was listening to this score in a car, and it was almost the last thing I heard on Earth. Because I was shooting a little show called BuzzFeed Unsolved with the crew. We were up in the mountains trying to find Bigfoot. It was snowing. And I thought it would be funny to put on some adventure music. So I put on the ride score for Indiana Jones. And as we did that, uh, we hit an ice patch. And our car slid. And we almost tumbled off the mountain. So we literally all almost died (laughs) to this score. (laughs) And I think I was in the middle of saying, Oh, dude, we're about to hit the snake part. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, that was almost the last thing I said on Earth, which would be apt for the life that I've led. Uh, Each Jeep provides synchronized stereo sound, and the dart room uses speakers on both sides off the vehicle and on both sides of the ride vehicle to accurately represent the sound of a dart flying overhead. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, In 2013, projection mapping was introed in the Mara room, which now has that instead of the old animation. We'll get into that later. And also, the the doors don't move anymore. They do not. We'll also get into that. Uh, there's also in the queue, this uh, right when you enter the temple, there's a little obelisk of doom, which kind of, if you look at it, it foreshadows the three, you know, the things that uh, lie ahead for you in terms of like snakes, fire, spikes, etc. The little man of Disneyland. Do you know about this guy? Little man of no. We're not talking about Mickey Mouse. We're talking about a 1955 children's book about the making of Disneyland and the little man who lives there. And he actually has a little door. Uh, the little door to his tree house is at the base of a tree to the right of the queue entrance of Indiana Jones. If you look there, you'll see a little door for the little man of Disneyland. Uh, the bamboo pole, which is in the queue, we used to be there. It said, um, caution, do not touch pole. And if you pulled this pole, the, the spikes in the spike room would come down. A very cool effect. Something my uncles would always do when we would walk through there and it would scare the hell out of me. And I would hit the deck. Uh, but I don't think that actually works. I haven't seen it. I think they took the pole out completely last time i was there i don't know if that was temporary You're talking about the one that actually like swings around yeah it's like a, it's it. a little like limp bamboo pole that's in the spike room if you pull well, it I'll, I'll report back yeah you could you could have added an addendum there. i know i never i know you've never seen a pool you didn't like to pull so. very good and it was right there and speaking of things you want to pull rope there's a there's a, a little rope gag in the well room where if you pull the rope a bunch of different automated responses will come out from archaeologists that are digging below very fun. Baxter added these things in because he noticed that kids, when you say don't touch something, will always touch it. So the, he added these signs of do not do this. And of course, them kids couldn't help themselves. And I was one of them. That's the invitation. Do not. <laughs> exactly. And I almost wonder if they took the bamboo pole out because of COVID. That's probably why they did it. Because they can't be encouraging a bunch of people to be tugging on something. Sometimes I feel like it's like, if they're like on the fence about it, it's like, well, it'll be way easier to maintain if we don't have it. So COVID, get it's rid of it. Under the guise of COVID, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but Which is why they know, I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist. Yeah, anymore. well, you, I'm, over. you know. I'm, I'm retiring from that life. Uh, there's a skeleton on the attraction wearing a Mickey ears cap that says bones on it. You know, Indiana bones. Very good. Uh, there's a crate in Indy's office in the queue that says deliver to Club Obi-Wan an ode to Temple of Doom, but also, of course, Obi-Wan Kenobi, which Harrison Ford was in those films. A nice little Easter egg, cross-pollination there. Uh, Speaking of Temple of Doom uh, and movies in general, screenwriters Willard Hook, Hyuk? This guy's last name sounds like something Goofy would say. (laughs) Hyuk? I'm not making a Goofy noise. That's this dude's name. And uh, Gloria Katz, uh, those two wrote for Temple of Doom, and they consulted on the script of this ride. 
So take that for what you will, depending on what you think of Temple of Doom. I think it's quite fun. But, you know, I'm also wearing an Indiana Jones outfit. So also in Indy's office is a map of the temple, a map of the actual ride path, uh, as if Indiana Jones himself mapped it out. And it includes little handwritten notes on what spots to close your eyes to keep yourself safe. Uh, There used to be a rotating chamber of destiny, as Byron uh, alluded to earlier, with only one real door that was in the middle and two fake doors on either side of that middle door. Uh, The cave that you drive through once you dispatch actually is a rotating cave. Think of it kind of like a giant carousel, almost like the carousel of progress. And it's rotating along these door frames to make it appear that you're choosing different doors to the right or left or the center. This used to be an effect that was in heavy rotation back in the day, but now it's currently in permanent disrepair due to the structural damage of the repeated movement that would happen. I think it was pulled by a a giant cable, and there's actually people who theorize that the people who made the cable have scammed Disney into basically making that cable snap and then just upping the price of that cable to replace it. That's the theory, at least. Have you seen, there's a, there's a video on YouTube of this effect. Yes. Like it was like CBS San Diego or something was given like a walkthrough, like back in the mid 2000, like 2005 or six. Yeah. Yeah. So as the cars leave the station, you know, you're, you're getting a choice. Your riches or you. And they show the effect. Like it was, it was cool to see it. Like, can he explain how it worked and showed it working? And it's all these people that support the ride and work on it every day. Um, And they're kind of talking about how much work and upkeep it takes. It's kind of surreal to see these, you know, things that are no longer working. And the people that should be financially supported to keep the things working, talking about it. Um, But that was the... I, I never, I never saw that effect. Oh so man, it was interesting. Yeah, it was such a big part of my childhood, and you could always clock that the effect was how it was working by looking. There was a mirror, actually, as you would um approach the uh the the little chambers of destiny, and you could see the mirror actually physically moving because it's moving along a wall that's moving because the walls are actually moving. Um, the mirror was supposed to be there just so you could see the you know the effect of which you know a little gate you're going through without actually directly looking into the eyes of mara uh but the mirror also kind of was how you could clock it the effect is there in some effect today uh it's not the moving walls it's now just projection technology and it's you're always going through the middle door now uh but each chamber still has a different spiel here they are (laughs) uh i'm not going to do a james earl jones impression i could try it's going to be fucking all right we'll cut it in you have chosen wisely. This path leads to timeless youth and beauty. You looked into my eyes. Your path now leads to the gate. He says that every time. And then the other one is... You seek the future. I will give the curtain of time. It is your death. And then the other one is... You seek the treasure of Mara. Glittering gold. It is yours. And then... You get whisked off to the gates of doom. Uh, but I, I, I'm glad that they kept the original narration there. You got a favorite one? I think the glittering gold. It is you. I don't know. I just like the yeah. the cadence of that one a little bit. Which one's yours favorite? I like the time one, just because like when you'd enter after after going through the door, they'd have like the stars like above you. Yeah, I and that was a really I, that one felt like the most like unique to me. My parents like the Fountain of Youth. Maybe that's Freudian there. I don't know. But the chambers all looked really cool, and they look really cool now, too. Also, for those wondering, the new updates after the 2023 uh, refurb include new lighting effects on Mara, a galaxy behind Indy, uh, and those double doors that he's holding shut, as opposed to the blue and green curtains that used to be there before. There's some new lighting effects in the Boulder Cave, uh, particularly when you go under the boulder and you make that uh, left turn, or right turn, rather. There's some cool stuff in there that happens. And there's a screen projection of a chamber collapsing before the dart room. And they also changed the projection up on the little rat uh, stall thing. Uh, we could talk about those later. Oh, and then uh, <laughs> I just wrote Ice Ice Baby. And I think that's a reference to the very well chronicled ice effect. I don't know if you know about this, Scott, but if you do, and maybe the listeners don't know, there used to be an effect where as you would see Indiana Jones for the first time, you make that left, you go towards the glory hole room, Mara shoots a laser at the ceiling, And then from the ceiling, a part of it collapses. And how they accomplished this was there was a bunch of ice 
on a little conveyor belt that would every 18 seconds dump ice from the ceiling that was dyed brown, and it would look like the ceiling was actually collapsing. Though this effect was very short-lived, not a lot of people have seen it. There is some footage of it, and to this day, you can actually still hear the audio cue for it falling in that moment. There's just no ice anymore. I wish I could have seen it, but apparently it got broken because of rust. There was like a rusting problem. I don't know. Sure. <laughs> I wish I could. I, I'm guessing you did not see this as well, Scott, because you just wrote it for the first time. Yeah, I never saw the effect. I did, I did see documentation of the effect. I just don't. I don't. Why did it have to be ice? I guess at the time they couldn't have, I don't know, plastic, like brown blocks. Like, why did it have to be ice? What a. Yeah, I don't I know. I didn't understand that. I guess you could make the argument that, like, maybe if the ice falls into a little receptacle, it melts and then they just keep yeah, redoing it. Yeah, recycles easier. However, they probably could have some sort of, like, pneumatic tube that sucks up the debris, puts it back, kind of like at the post office when it makes that great dunk noise, you know, <laughs> dunk, and that kind of stuff. Um, I don't know why they couldn't do that here. I agree. Uh, one of the goat ride effects, probably one of the greatest theme park effects of all time, the moving boulder. Firstly, your car is not moving backwards. The ride vehicles are actually stationary when you're in here. And instead, the walls that are in this tunnel, the walls in the ceiling are moving. The walls aren't attached to the ground and the walls are moving to make it feel like you're moving backwards. And the boulder itself is actually just rolling in place on a little platform until the very end when the boulder does actually move forward a little bit as it's pushed by a little hidden sled. Um, and then your, your car darts under it. I think the sled push is to give it an enhanced feel of it moving a little faster as it's about to crush you. Um, or maybe they just didn't want to make a ball rolling for that much track, so then they devised this uh, this wall-moving system. But one of the weird quirks of these EMV vehicles, as, as advanced as they are, they couldn't go backwards. So they had to think of, how do we make it seem like your car is backing up without your car actually backing up? They came up with the moving tunnel. Which, do you know Do you know the inspiration for the moving tunnel? No. Have you heard of that? No. Uh, it was Tony Baxter in a car wash. He was in a car wash, and it tripped him out with like the machinery moving toward him and that sparked the idea of oh if we just get the you know the entire surrounding to move it'll create the illusion that you're going backwards that's crazy and you know what's insane about that is it's probably something they were trying to figure out like oh we have this boulder set piece we want the car to back up away from it cars can't go backwards how the hell are we going to do this maybe he's like i'm going to go take a walk maybe i'll go wash my car <laughs> and then just a eureka moment immediately the universe works in his favor incredible it's a legendary effect i mean anytime i'm at a at the grocery store and the car next to me starts backing up it's that mental break moment where you're like am i moving nope nope they're moving so it's just kind of like uh it's such a cool effect that somehow it always works even when you know it's there i it look for works. it and i still buy it Oh, it's, yeah, it's, so, it's so effective. I'm still like ducking my head when, by, the, by the time the boulder's there. I, it's one of the very many instances, not just on this attraction, but in Imagineering in general, where they have like a, a legit logistical problem and it actually results in cooler creative. Like even the queue itself was because of a logistical problem. They needed to get people to that show building out in the parking lot. So we get this amazing queue, arguably one of the best queues. We'll talk about that a little later too. Um, but the uh, the last fun fact I have here, there's uh, actually Imagineer's initial, uh, initials and birthdays on every one of the ride vehicles, one on each vehicle of all 17 key creatives who worked on this ride. Obviously, Tony Baxter is one of them. You could look for that on the uh, dash of the car on the lower left if you're looking at the steering wheel. I heard something just like went like back to like original concepts where when they were trying to figure out like how to get people like half a mile away, there's even talks about get like having jungle crews like have a route that would like shuttle you back there, to that area there was a rumor of having the jungle crews actually drop you off on the in the queue of the attraction of indy which would be interesting yeah because that's like a whole other, then you have to wait in another queue it's a little odd yeah but it was supposed to be all intertwined and now and now they're so sad they didn't do it because they could have done two genie pluses for that oh, man no. they could have charged you twice that's true could have done jungle cruise and indiana jones and offered as a value dungeons. proposition yeah you, you show up to the second one too and you're like oh you got your individual lightning lane <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> i mean well i guess you got to go back unless you want to like open up that app dad and not disappoint your entire family <laughs> yeah look if you if it got me the jungle cruise going through the show building i'm down 
Uh, anyways, that does it for fun facts. Let's move on to some first impressions. But before we do that, let's take a, another second to thank our sponsors. And we are back. Thank you, sponsors. And if not, thank you to you guys for watching because <laughs> just something I'm going to say there to make myself feel not embarrassed. Uh, first impressions. Let's uh, recount our first time on the ride and what initial effect it had on them. Scott, you already kind of touched on this, but is there anything else you'd like to share in terms of like, what were you thinking when you unstrapped your seatbelt here? Yeah, I mean, I had ridden, uh, so at Walt Disney World, we have the dinosaur attraction, yes. which is the same ride vehicles. So like, I kind of went in, I, I mean, I was hoping that there would be some dinosaurs. Unfortunately, there were not. No dinosaurs. Um, so I wasn't going in expecting that, but I felt like I knew what I was doing getting into i knew what the ride would be and i i just came out like forget the ride we have in florida this thing is so immersive you know i rode it the first time without a lot of those effects and it's still like left this huge impression on me um and then of course i learned about all the things that used to be there and then now i'm like oh i wish i had seen that um but i mean it, it's still that that reveal at glory hall the all the effects, the time that I wrote it, all those effects were working. I know sometimes they're not all working. There's not fire. There's not, you know, there's not the, the smoke on the ground at times after it's recently reopened. Yes. But when I wrote it, like everything, the snake was working. Amazing. It was all like, it was, it was incredible. That's kind of one of the sad things that we will talk about later is the fact that we have to be like, it was great. Everything was working. <laughs> <laughs> like something you had to point out. Uh, it didn't break down mid rides. So that's that's great. very nice. Uh, also, just uh, two things I forgot to mention there. Yes, this ride was basically it's the same ride vehicles as the dinosaur attraction in the Animal Kingdom over in Disney World. It's actually the same exact layout. They literally just reskinned Indiana Jones, made the same exact ride, saved money on research and development, and just slapped dinosaurs in there. And uh, as far as the glory hole. The big room, the glory hole, I'm referring to the room that has the bridge and Mara statue. That was inspired by the Imagineers going over to Knott's Berry Farm and seeing the glory hole in the minecart attraction over there. And so they're like, wow, the scale of this is amazing. We got to do this for Indy. Classic. And, and they did. Which I think some could even argue that some things about that Calico Mine ride inspired probably the likes of like pirates and oh for Mansion. sure i want to we're going to cover the calico mine ride at some point on this podcast i don't know if you've been to knott's berry farm scott but it's fantastic we'll get we'll get five viewers for that one I'm <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it'll be for us for sure it's so solely for us hey, one more thing uh on the the dinosaur ride uh in florida i had the opposite i guess experience with that because i rode that attraction when it first opened when it was Countdown to Extinction, when yes. it was a completely different attraction. I never done I'm that. I'm so jealous. I'm jealous. I mean, you want to talk about scaring kids? Oh, like, my God. Fuck that yeah. was the scariest thing I have ever ridden. And I wrote it, so this was 2001 or two. So, I mean, like, I was in my, I wasn't even, I was in my late teens. And the on-ride photo of me on that attraction, <laughs> I am the most scared I have ever been in my entire life. Um, at that moment, I didn't know what the fuck was about to happen. <laughs> it doesn't quite capture the way that I'm feeling, but I have to tell everyone that is, it's pure terror on my face. <laughs> yeah. And I'm kind of making the same face that the dino is, is making at me. I'm kind of growling back at it. Oh um, and everyone else in my family is like diving out of their seats yeah. to get away from this. Uh, this dinosaur. It was just. It was an. It was an amazing attraction. It's completely different now. Completely different story. Completely different everything. Um, so it's kind of the opposite with the the indie. Like I, I got to see the the second version without some of the effects. It's still the same story. Yeah. If, but, if you could scrounge up that ride photo, we'd love to to put it on the. Oh I gosh. will. I will find it and I will just send it to this group. Yes. Oh, incredible. I went to Animal Kingdom in two thousand with my family, so that was like. It was still relatively pretty new, and the line was so long for 
what was countdown to extinction at that time we never went on it and it's oh. one of, it's the one of the I mean, obviously it's like i was eight year old it's eight your life's old. greatest reset, i had i had no say reset. in whether or not you know i could wait in the line and i love dinosaurs but it's one of the biggest like regrets of my life to not <laughs> the biggest regrets of yes, your life. it really is did you tell your mom you're gonna because rue this know, day because, forever because, we didn't get on no, countdown be, yeah because there's no i don't think that any pov if there is one out there is gonna do it justice uh, and that's like you'll never we'll never get that only, how many times only Scott, do you think about this Scott. per month um i well per month no like per per day i you, you don't know. think about this once a oh, day. oh no at least like three times i think that's a day i uh, i weep i weep <laughs> over the uh the loss of those potential um jump scares all right let's not bum the listeners out what, do, what was your first impression of indy oh oh do like, you have a review for your mom? i put in a request this morning i gotta see if i got it was it's early but Yes, I have, mom, a, I, have a, I have a nice. text reply from my mom because we my first time I went on this ride, I would think I was about six years old. This is from my mom. We approached the Indiana Jones ride entrance and we were all so excited to get on it. It was to date probably my all time favorite ride because of its creativity and the fact we loved the Indiana Jones character and movies that's true as a little kid. I was a massive. That's what got me into movies. I me, think, me too. Was Raiders of the Lost Ark. Me too. She continues, we wanted so badly for you to get on it as we were rushing you through to get in. I remember dragging you by the hand to get in quickly. The cast member at the entrance stopped you to measure you before approaching. It was like, because it had that like cobra, the cobra height, height measure, which is just yeah. the coolest thing. Um, and we had given you tips on how to make the height requirements, such as standing on your tippy toes. And you did that and you were still shy of the height line. But the cast member was nice enough to let you through because you were really, really close. He could probably see the excitement in your eyes, but it may have also been fear because new ride experiences made you nervous when you were little. Um, <laughs> I will say I must have been bluffing pretty well because as a kid, I was I remember being terrified as she was dragging me by the hand. I almost didn't want to be tall enough. And they're like, and I do remember the back. Like, oh, OK, good enough. And I thought I was like. Oh, I'm just a little short too bad. Yeah, yeah. And my mom's like, yay! And like was just pulling <laughs> me through internally. I was so intimidated by this temple. And like, especially at six years old, I was like afraid of like horror stuff or like, yeah. And yeah. like, I loved Indiana Jones, but I was still like now very intimidated by what was going to be in this, you know, loud, dark ride. However, I do remember leaving this attraction extremely excited and also just feeling like you did accomplish a, like a venture like and did you know overcome some fear a certain yeah, yeah a set of fear and i think that's i think we kind of lose that a lot recently where i think a lot of things are more like toned down and well jenny nicholson said it really well that a lot of the disney right? attractions lately the storylines don't really revolve around peril of any sort which kind of gives the stakes of the ride this like deflated feeling yeah and that is a concern of I, I have with Tiana. I hope they still keep a sense of danger, but we'll see. That would be nice. Uh, my first impression, very similar. It's very centered around that stupid Cobra height indicator because <laughs> I, my family would go to Disneyland once a year uh, as like our little treat because we didn't really go on a lot of vacations, but we went to Disneyland once a year. When this ride opened, which what, what year was it? It was 95? 95. Yeah, I was too small in 95. And I just remember walking up to that Cobra and just my head just went straight under it. And I was just devastated. And I had already done all the things I could. Like I did the Captain America stuff in newspapers in my shoes. I did the thing where I like inhale very deeply to give myself an extra little bit. It just didn't work. I, I want to say the next year I also was too short. That and, makes sense. And then the year after that at seven, I walked straight up to it fully expecting Oh my God, here we go again, right under this fucking Cobra. And I was so sure of it that I walked forward at pace and fully headbutted this, this Cobra <laughs> and just like an ironing board fell straight on my back and the cast members were like, oh my God, because like they just saw a kid get CTE live <laughs> and I was on the ground and my mom was like, are you okay? And I was like, hell yeah, dude, let's get on the ride. <laughs> I was so excited. I did not even care that I had what was the beginning of a well to my forehead. That's a half mile march to victory, too. Exactly. I was I felt so victorious and just like because I had only heard what it was like from my dad because like I was like, you got to tell me what it's like. 
Um, and he was, he knew I would love it. And so I just remember being so happy when I finally got onto this thing and it was instantly my favorite ride. Still is my favorite ride. This is my favorite ride of all time. Um, that's a, that's a bold statement. It is. It's my favorite ride of all time. I would like to think that maybe Haunted Mansion's my second, but this is probably my first. And you know, I'd say a lot of people would agree with you. That there's plenty of reasons too. Do I think it's the best yeah. ride in existence right now? Uh, no, I oh, don't. Oh, see, like personal favorite. It's my okay. personal favorite. Mm-hmm. This is how I think like, you know, my favorite basketball player of all time is Kobe. Is he the best of all time? I don't know about that. Quick story, just because it's, it's funny to hear you guys kind of tell the same experience that I had with my eight-year-old is he really wanted to ride it when we went last year, um, but he was terrified, but he like convinced himself to do it. We get yeah. in line and it breaks down and oh, we're walking no. out. We're walking out. He's like, dad, I'm kind of glad it broke. <laughs> Cause he was like, <laughs> <laughs> he went for it. Cause he really, I kept telling him how great it was and he wanted to do it kind of, I think I found out after the fact more for me. But like we're walking out, he's like, "Dad, no, I, I'm kind of glad. I'm kind of glad. Like we were literally about to get on it, and it broke. So um, it was just that. That's going to be his first memory, even though it's not the first time he wrote it. Is he almost did? He didn't want to, and then thankfully, old reliable delivered and gave him a, a breakdown. <laughs> did he? Uh, did, did he feel guilty? Like he had done that with his mind? Like he was just sitting there? Please break down. Please break down. I, he did. He didn't say that, but I I bet it crossed his mind. He, <laughs> he somehow caused it. He's gonna get it next time we go. Let's move on to the good and the bad. We talk about what uh, are the good things and the bad things about this ride. Um, and feel free to jump in with any goods or bads. Or if you disagree with me, go ahead and just be like, nah, nah, dude. Uh, but before we do that, let's once again thank our sponsors. And we are back. Thank you for supporting the podcast. Uh, let's start with some good here. Oh, we just talked about it. I do love the Cobra height little indicator, even though it was my nemesis for two years. Uh, it's it's an excellent piece of theming, as opposed to just kind of those generic ones you see now, which is just a sign and like the little red line. It's kind of cool to, for there to be a Cobra. Uh, the exterior queue, the Jungle Cruise ambiance. You see the Jungle Cruise boats floating by. They're making jokes about us standing in line. Now coming up on the right-hand side, we have our first stop, the Mystic Temple of the Forbidden Eye. Also known as the Mystic Temple of the Forever Broken Ride. It's a great atmosphere. You got the animals. And that amazing outdoor facade of the temple is fantastic. Probably one of the best facades in the entire resort. And it's hidden from view until you get in the queue, which is like just this kind of nice little surprise that you get when you turn that corner. And then we got the interior queue. I'm a big uh, sound guy. Uh, I love like audio loops and things like that. And the interior cue noise that you get inside the indie line is so specific. You don't know, think you know it until you hear it, but it's this kind of like howling wind. And there's this like kind of odd sounding percussion. It sounds like they did it with a drum, but I think what they're going for is like the distant sound of like archeologists working with tools perhaps. Um, but it plays like a, almost like a strange like temple drum, but uh, it's fantastic ambiance inside of there. And then, of course, as you're walking through the queue, you get little openings in the ceiling where you see the trees outside. You get some more of the animals coming through. They just really immerse you in this environment from the beginning. And especially once once you enter the indoor portion of the queue, it's fantastic. We got the bat caves. There's a little diamond statue in there. I don't know what the hell that thing is. It's like a, if you look in the bat cave, it's on the top right, on the top right side. There's like a little nook. And it's sitting in there as this like kind of statue. I've always wondered what that is. I couldn't find anything about it. Uh, the detail in the queue. I we got the bamboo poles holding up the ceilings. We have work lights lining the winding walkways. There's disarmed booby traps that Indy has figured out for you. Don't step on the diamonds on the floor. I used to think if I stepped in those diamonds, the the bricks above would crush me. So I would always make sure to step around them when I was a kid. Now I step on them because I'm an adult. You know what I noticed with those for the first time that I didn't notice as a kid? And it's just, it's such a clever detail is how the archaeologists or people that went into that dig site. Yeah. Like you're, you're visiting it as if it's already been like worked in and lived in. It's incredible. Uh, the murals of Mara on the ceilings, looking down at you all over the place. It, it feels like you're actually at an archaeological site with, you know, we have the vegetation crawling and hanging from the ceilings. Just all of the, everything about this ride is just immaculately detailed. Uh, we talked about it earlier, the spike room and the rope gag. Love it. Love an interactive uh, point in the queue, especially when it doesn't involve like your phone. 
which a lot of the interactive elements in now modern queues have. Like I'm thinking of like even we covered this recently, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. There's like an iPad essentially just embedded in like <laughs> in like rocks as part of the interactivity of that queue. Um, and then I have a bullet here that just says Sala. Love seeing my guy Sala. Loved him in the films. One of my favorite movie lines of all time. Asps, very dangerous. You go first. Classic. <laughs> Uh, he's just a fun guy and he's having a blast. Apparently not, though, because it's the guy who's portraying him, Bob I was going to say, you said you love seeing him. Just seeing him. Not hearing him, just seeing him. <laughs> well, I had to revise because now apparently I'm not sure if I'm actually hearing him. But uh, whoever is doing the voiceover, whether or not it's John Reese davies or Bob Joles, gives, in my opinion, one of the best on-ride performances in a ride that I could think of in terms of, like, the safety spiel. He's up there with Warburton. From Soren, he's up there with the guy from Dinosaur that's over in, in Florida. He's up there with the guy who does the Flight of Passage. Like all The safety spiel is a hard thing to kind of perform, and whoever did it for this ride, even though it's just on that film reel, nailed it. Because I love that film reel. The projection room, very fun way to kind of establish the lore. We get the kind of like, ah, the eyes on the globe. Indiana Jones comes in here. Will he die? I don't know. Like that whole amazing thing. It just sets a yeah. mood. You're in 1935. Exactly. It's all period accurate. I also love in the safety spiel when they talk about the peril of the temple and they cut to like, oh, you may get hurt in this. Essentially, mm. they just show a skeleton. Now, my friend, one final word of advice. Once you've entered the chamber of destiny, look not into the eyes of the idol. That would be dangerous. Very dangerous. <laughs> look what happens to you. You turn into a full-blown skeleton. Also love Sala being having his mind blown by the idea of seatbelts. <laughs> He's stoked about these seatbelts. Here are special belts attached into the seats. Simply pull it from the right, inserting it into the left, like so. You see the excellence of this invention? Like, I, I don't know if I'd be that stoked if I saw a seatbelt for the first time, but I guess, like, people were just flying through the dash. But it gets you day. stoked to get on that ride. These are little phrases you hear, and if I were to hear them, like, come through randomly on a radio it would activate me like the Winter Soldier, like the Manchurian Candidate. I would like immediately be on the ride. The load zone, even that is gorgeous. If you look up in the load zone, the scale of just like how high that ceiling goes, you see the vines falling through the opening. You feel like you're in an Indiana Jones film. I mean, they just nailed it. There's really no other way to put it. They fucking nailed it. Um, some of the coolest looking ride vehicles in the game I'm trying to think of other ride vehicles that I would even put above these in terms of any ride I've been on. Just from an aesthetic level, these Jeeps, they got to be top of the heap for me. I mean, like if we're talking best ride vehicles, maybe you're thinking the Doom buggies. You're thinking, I can't think of another one that immediately jumps to mind that are as cool looking and as iconic as these indie Jeeps. Because I know in Dinosaur, they have like the time travel vehicles. They don't look, mm -hmm. they look a little too clearly they are like let's change this up a little bit it, it's hard to compare them just because they don't i mean they they look cool but yeah. just all that it can do so it's it's hard to even like try it's almost it's a different tier like it's just a different tier all the flexibility that you can do with it it's um it's premiere for sure like like if you were gonna take like how i think about this is if you were gonna buy an act like a toy version of a ride vehicle and put it on your desk i can't think of many others that i would put above this Maybe Cosmic Rewinds are pretty cool looking. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't think people would instantly recognize like, oh my God, is that the Indiana Jones Jeep? Like people would, theme partners would immediately recognize these. And once again, a, a, a creative solve for a logistical problem. They had these massive kind of motors that move, you know, hydraulic motors. They had to hide them. So they made these ride vehicles. Incredible. Uh, radio check-in at the beginning of the ride always gets me jacked. Just very excited. Uh, hello, hello. Oh, my friend. Uh, the brakes may be needing a little <laughs> And then you go right into the Chamber of Destiny. Instantly hypnotized by the doors and the chamber. I remember as a kid when they had the old, more, uh, you know, kind of, I guess, archaic lighting effects, but I think they worked a little better than the projections they have now. Just, it's just a really great opening to a ride. <laughs> Just once I want to go to the Gates of Doom. Every time we go over and he's like, look, you're now parts of the Gates of Doom. You're trying to go down that hallway and you make a hard left. Kind of looks cozy in that hallway. Honestly, I do want to see what's down there. Always wondered about it. 
it's a cool little uh, thing yeah. they do there. Indiana Jones is like pretending to like be Muscles McGee and like hold the gates back, but he's really just trying to send you the other way so he can jump back into the VIP lounge. <laughs> also, in that little uh that little kind of like door chamber room that has all the snake pillars. I love the thunder strikes that are like there's like little lightning strikes along the walls that are coinciding with thunder slaps. Really cool stuff in there. And then that first indie sighting, I have that here where we were introduced to the randomization of lines that he could say to you of him just roasting your ass. That's probably my favorite one. Then another one. Tourists, you had to look, didn't you? Oh, we got a problem here. Turn left, up to the left, and watch it. There's big steps up there, which is great storytelling because then you actually fly down steps or the vehicles make you feel like you're flying down steps really cool stuff and then the last one is uh you looked this one i've never heard i've never even heard this one i'm wondering if you have byron you looked there's powers here that you can't possibly comprehend quick take the left passage it's the only way out Ugh, nice driving pal i hear nice driving pal yeah is that like a fairly new one I don't think so. I've always heard like after, nice driving pal. It's hard to hear him because he's yeah. screaming at you. Yeah, while you're... I don't recall that first part. Uh, but I mean, I guess I'll, I don't know. I'll listen for it now. But I love hearing Indy just brutalize you. Yeah. Not bad <laughs> for tourists. That's one of the end <laughs> ones. Uh, the beginning of this ride score also comes in right after you see Indiana Jones. You kind of get like the little, the and then it hits you with the iconic Raiders March. Fantastic stuff. Uh, as you then uh, go down the steps and you get this great reveal of the glory hole room. Like they use that little cue for a lot of great reveals. As, like, and, as soon as you feel safe with like the iconic score like, swelling in, it reveals that massive glory hole and, and as, immediately shuts it down. Like, no, you're still in danger. And as that little score part comes in, a laser shoots at you, and that's where the ice would fall out. But now it's just just the laser. I'll take the laser. Um, but they do a great job in the score of queuing up little moments. Every little reveal in this ride is accompanied by a score cue, uh, which is very similar to the films. When Indiana Jones does things, you hear the Raiders are uh, like the little Raiders horn cue. It's like his hero moment. And in this, they do the same thing for the moments of peril. It's really great storytelling. The skeleton corridor. Uh, this probably should have been a fun fact, but I didn't know they used a big ass fan in there that's going like 60 miles per hour to make it feel like you're going really fast. That skeleton corridor used to scare the shit out of me as a kid too, by the way. <laughs> it's a good, it's good stuff. The bridge reveal once again has that cue. Uh, uh, everything has a moment. And then you, uh, I didn't know if you guys noticed this, but the, when you go across the bridge, you're actually entering a giant snake's mouth. Like if you look up the, the, the bridge landing, you're oh, going into the mouth of a giant snake. And of course, the ride vehicles are making you feel like the bridge is giving way. Yeah, and then they have the audacity to have it like kind of stop midway and have like the fire pop up and you're like, just get me over the bridge, Exactly. Please. Well, I mean, you had to stop because there's a, a fucking laser being shot at the car, <laughs> which then puts smoke up when the effect's working. It's truly when everything is firing on all cylinders in this room, it is crazy. And then of course you go to the snake, which also has a fun little... <laughs> you turn around the corner, you get a, a classic little indie line. He says two lines, as far as I've seen. Uh, snakes. You guys are on your own. And then there's another one that's, careful, watch out for anything that slithers. I prefer the second one. I prefer the first one. Well, I think I think it's so true to like, that's just a piece of Indiana Jones's character. It's like the one thing is just like, I won't, I won't help you out with this one. Were you terrified of this giant snake as much as I was? Because I, I loved, was. I loved snakes as a kid. Like I liked actually, I had like a pet snake for a period of time. Like, but it was, this was a massive, big, scary cobra. So 100 feet long. long. You see the tail you first. You see it, as but you're going then you around, bend yeah. around. And so you're like, oh, okay. Like, we're not dealing with this snake right now. You're going to deal with it in a few seconds. It, it is definitely scary. You, you have time to think about it. That makes that effect so much better because it builds up. Again, I wrote it the first time as, a, as an adult. I still was not expecting it to lurch. Motion. Yeah, I was not <laughs> expecting that at all. So, but it, it definitely was heightened because I, had a moment to think about it. it wasn't just a jump scare it was kind of a, a build-up i have so. a distinct memory of hyping myself up to ride on the right side of the ride vehicle which is closest to where the snake is and it was a big moment for me to be able to just kind of sit there but i uh 
I definitely kind of like <laughs> kind of matrixed my way away from this guy because I was like, if I get too close, this guy's gonna headbutt me because somebody had told me in school that they had headbutted that snake and I just believed it was real. And so I thought maybe the snake, if I moved my head forward, you know, forward enough, he would give me a big old uh, dome check. Uh, anyways, uh, classic indie score as you jaunt around the idol. This is like a classic part of the films when indie's like in a perilous situation. There. <laughs> That whole thing is incredible. Uh, and it cues up to a perfect moment when a fireball comes out from under the bridge in the lava pit. Uh, I think it goes like a dun 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 it's fantastic. But it, it's synced up so well with that. It's like a little drop. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's yeah. It's, it's, it's every, everything. Ha- like I said, they queued up everything to have a moment and maximum impact with the score accompanying that. They find ways to, you know, imply what you're about to see before you see it. Therefore, you could actually have a greater impact. Then the next thing I have here, dart room. You know, you're ducking to, the, to a banger of a score. <laughs> I don't know if I want to tell this story, but that's the uh, score for the bug chamber in Temple of Doom. Oh, There's yes. a sequence in Temple of Doom where they get tra- trapped in this chamber that has spikes and they start to try and kill Indian short round and they manage to get out. And then Willie comes over, bends over to pick something up, accidentally triggers the spikes coming down. And this score comes in again with a dun, 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 dun. And uh, when we were in college, we would go out for thirsty thursday obviously and and, you know have a couple drinks and by couple maybe a little bit more we would be feeling pretty gross friday but then friday night would come around we'd be going out again and that first drink we would have on friday night i would always imagine this score playing again of just the chamber starting over again and all just, <laughs> just like a first shot is like dun, 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 like oh no we are going to die yeah i love that <laughs> shot with his fist <laughs> anyways uh love seeing indy hang hang out in that little chamber he's saying a bunch of funny stuff at you um and this boulder to this day still a feat still incredible to look at the effect is so convincing and it's thrilling it's genuinely thrilling to go under that boulder I don't know how fast this thing goes under when you when you duck under it but it feels fast um and i love the screech of the tires as you kind of turn in that dark little tunnel after you miss right the they, they create this sensation of like a drift in like multiple parts of the ride the i don't vehicle. know how much of it is the motion of the vehicle combined with just really good sound design but i love when it makes that like swerving drift feeling it, it's the same when you like skirt into the uh the scene with like the 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 skeleton shooting the arrows or you know or the blow darts or whatever at you well one of the things about this ride that i love so much is they were probably the most purposeful with a ride layout more so than any other ride that i could think of because the way it's laid out you have these kind of long tunnels that show you an effect you get scared by it or and then you make a sharp turn and it reveals a whole nother story element and even the dart room, after you leave the dart room, that turn to reveal Indy hanging in front of a boulder uh, is, is incredible. And the, and, the, and the score point to that is also, uh, I think it starts with like some horns that goes, dun, 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 dun. And then yeah. you are like, wait, what am I taking in? It just perfectly sets you up to take in everything in this ride. Just really well designed. Would you guys consider, I mean, like I'm just going off the top of my head. Is there a better finale to an attraction than Indy? this boulder set piece? No, because not only do you get to, to see the boulder almost crush you, but then you see Indy standing in front of the boulder trapped behind a wall, showing that like, oh, we did escape. And you and then he delivers his pithy little lines at the end. Not bad. Tourist. Now, stay out of trouble, will you? It's a fantastic ending, and it really feels satisfying every single time. Uh, and we'll talk about that in the exit like, hall test. You get to live bit, uh, perhaps like the most iconic moment of that franchise it's easily one of the best finales but it's without a doubt like the most iconic to have such an iconic thing from it saved for the finale right because they easily could have thrown it as the front of like okay like this is what you're gonna get right away and then like this or the whole ride is you running from a boulder like it, it could have been that but it's like the the cherry on top to be saved for the finale and pull it off so well. Yeah, yeah, it's a big ass cherry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that, 
But I mean, like it, it is definitely one of the best finales, but I feel like to have the finale be such an iconic moment, I don't even, I don't even know what to compare it to. No. And they, rights. they find ways to mix a lot of the, sh- the elements you see from the films into these big show pieces, like the darts that's similar to what happens to Indy when he jumps into the lake at the beginning of Raiders. We have snakes, which is obviously tied into Indy's fear with snakes. And then, you know, of course, the the bridge, the suspended bridge plays into Indy's fear of bridges in Temple of Doom. So, like, they mm-hmm. did a good job of paying homage to the films while still having its own yeah. contained story. So when you get to that final piece, like, the nostalgia feels so earned. Exactly. And then we have the end here. This is my last good that I wrote down. More Sala. Right. He has a bunch of funny little things, and I think they're all catered to what uh, chamber you got at the beginning, which is just kind of showing the customization of this ride. That's the one that I like the most because the stroller line is so fucking goofy. <laughs> I love it. Uh, but that's my last good. Is there anything else in this ride that you particularly like, Scott, that you're like? Let's talk about that. You mentioned the bridge a few times. Like I, that. That's such a... Um the view at that moment, but also just there's so many things going on yes. while you're also like crossing over this sketchy bridge. There's just like, it's such an oversaturation of everything. Like the, the lighting, the music. Um, I feel like that moment is almost different every time I ride. I don't know if it's because I'm choosing to look at different things or ex- like fo- trying to focus on different moments. Yeah. Um, but that is, that feeling is still that is that is my the boulder part iconic nice payoff but that is the moment where you feel like you are in this right at that moment that is it yeah you're in the temple almost from yep. like the temple of doom it's 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 an incredible just scale moment and probably like one of the precursors to some of the stuff they do at scale later like even in rise like when you walk out and you see the size of that hangar bay I don't think we get something to that scale unless Indy does it first with this this giant chamber or to that degree knots over at the Calico Mine ride. Uh, but it's kind of fun to see how things build on things. You mentioned it, uh, and I didn't comment on them, but the at the door towards the beginning of the ride, the lightning effects, I don't know what it is about that too. That moment, I don't feel like I'm on a ride. I feel like I'm in something. And I don't know what it is about that. It like draws your eyes. Yeah, forward. yeah. But that whole thing, it just like surrounds you. Um, that's almost like a, an understated immersion that they have going at that moment. Well, they're um, also kind of like rocking you to it in the ride vehicle. There's kind of like this bouncing yeah. aspect of, to that part of the ride where they're just kind of like, it's like a controlled lurch, which I love. Yeah. Uh, Byron, did you have any Incredible. more goods? I'll say a balls to the wall danger. This feels like the Mad Max of like theme park rides. Oh, yeah, yeah. From the get go all the way through these three minutes. Like, yeah, you're saying it, comparatively like three minutes doesn't seem like the longest kind of ride in the world. But when the pacing is as rapid as it is and it just feels like danger that's just from the get go starts and just keeps building throughout the ride, you feel like you're getting way more than three minutes worth in that. Um, such a rare ride system, yep. you know? Yeah insanely innovative the first of its kind when it came out in the 90s and besides dinosaur and the clone over in japan they haven't they haven't replicated it it's, it's kind of because it probably has a lot of problems I, I think part of it's it's i think it's very difficult to maintain I, I think this did eventually gravitate toward you know doing the slot car ride system yeah which is um, essentially they just took out the uh <laughs> the EMV aspect of it or the simulator aspect of it and just try to refine the reliability and make the cars go faster, such as test track and radiator springs racers. Um, so it's cool that it feels exclusive. I mean, this ride in general, we don't get many know, exclusive things only anymore, in Japan, like. only here. I know there's talk that they had it like what D 23 about Maybe bringing really. Indiana Jones over. I mean, they I, could because animal like Animal Kingdom's dinosaur is exactly the same layout, so they could easily just yeah. But then again, it just doesn't feel like they're getting. I don't know. I'm also being selfish here, where I enjoy dinosaur because it feels like something different when I, I go to too. Disney World. I like and I, I enjoy I enjoy the juicy exclusive, as you like to say. A juicy exclusive is nice. Um, I'll say I'll, I'll add to Indiana Jones Adventure. It's a beast. You know, as soon as you go into that glory hole, you see everything before your eyes and then it's like okay now we're gonna tuck you away into these nooks and crannies and have the individual 
But just to demonstrate that scale and make it feel larger than life and real gives them kind of that ability to sell the danger in these little nooks and crannies because you know you're going to have to go face those other challenges that's true up yeah. ahead um as opposed to just being like in the dark like a dinosaur and just like okay we're getting to the next show scene okay to the next it just feels like one massive you know connected story, large, yeah. Yeah. yeah and the, the temple feels endless in that sense and, and they pull it off just through you know walking for, through the facade and walking half a mile um i'm still picking up on new details for this ride every time i go like if you it's just, yeah it is to to cover the amount of ground and square footage that they do from the queue all the way through well, the especially exit. including the queue yeah. and you know you walk half a mile in you go on the three minute ride and then you walk half a mile out it is like there's just yeah. no it's detail everywhere everywhere you look even like the outdoor queue now yeah. now i sit and i like look around that outdoor queue and it's like i'm completely in a jungle yeah it's incredible like the sight lines are phenomenal um Steering wheel. I don't know if you threw this in the back. I love the steering wheel aspect. I wish it kind of moved, but um, I think especially for kids, it's like it always felt like when we were a group with friends as a kid growing up, you'd always want to get the birthday boy or girl, you know, on Baxter actually into, talks behind about the this. wheel, and because that's an extra thrill level. Baxter talked about this in terms of just trying to appeal to that MTV generation in the sense that we need some sort of interactivity or a gaming aspect to it, something that we feel like we have control over. He described like when you're on Pirates, you're just kind of chilling there and watching them, whereas Indy, you're driving the car. Uh, so that was something he thought about. Yeah, even leading up to these, these ride vehicles like you, like you touched up on the pre-show, I feel like less is more. Just doing the, doing the projections, making it feel old school and lived in the 1930s. Um, very tasteful way of, you know, giving people like a quick visual representation of the ride. I don't know if they do the newsreels as much, but setting up the story the way they Perfect. do where you don't, you, there is a story being told before you even get to the projection room, but then it just refines it. Um, I like the idea the story of you're going to save Indiana Jones or try and find help him. And then mm -hmm. now he's in there and he's like, well, now I have to save you. It's well, a fun little. And well, it's one of those where it doesn't feel like the tourist aspect is as <clears throat> forced because they set up that, Oh my God, like we have access now and we've like, and now like tourists are like scrambling to get in there and try and find like riches of their own, almost yeah. like kind of like the gold mine or the gold rush effect. No, it's, and you're just one of those setup. people going in to try and find your riches and then you get a massive curveball. Yeah. You know, sometimes you try and find riches and other times you almost headbutt a giant snake. Let's move on to the bad here. And I only have a couple. I love this ride, like I said. So I really had to think about these. Uh, the projections on Mara, the new, I don't want to be that guy, but I think they're kind of dorky. I, I preferred the old just kind of flashing eyeball effect they used to have. But yeah, now it, it is kind of cool to see like the new idle blink and all that stuff. But I, I don't know. I think it's just a bit much. <laughs> I, I could be in the minority there. That could be a good. But uh, do you like the projections, Scott? Or I mean, they're fine. I just, I have a problem with projections that I can tell are projections. Yes, yes. Like, so it just there's not enough practical they the way they had to do it I, I get it but it's it's when i see it i know it's a projection and i don't think it's because i saw it before i didn't see it that many times before they added these projections like you guys have but i i still look at it and i i know that's a projection and so i don't look at the the lightning effect that i talked about earlier i don't look at it and know that it's not a real effect yeah, or, I'm yeah. sorry, that it's not real. Like, I don't think that that is, that is something added in the same way that I look at that projection and I'm just kind of like, eh. But, I mean, it, I'm not passionately against it or anything, but it just, it doesn't feel necessary. Yeah, I think you nailed that because when I look at it, I'm like, you know what, it's a good projection, but I'm still thinking it's a good prescription, which means I am taken out of the ride. No, that's probably the best way to describe it is like, you could tell it's a projection. And that's when it, it kind of falls flat because it takes me out of the story. Um, but it, it's well done for what it's worth. You know, I, I don't like it as much, especially out on the doors. I prefer yeah. the old rotating door chamber. Well, the but... thing is, there's so many like, impressive practical <clears throat> elements that I feel like if there's any ride that could get away with doing a little less is more. Yeah, it's, it is Indiana Jones. I, w I would agree with that. It doesn't fit in the world of practicality that it's built. What I would almost compare it to when they... Um added the projections on Big Thunder 
in the the lift hill. Yes, the yeah, dynamite. or the dynamite. Yeah, like mm-hmm. I feel like that is more done is done better because I, I don't like I know that's not an explosion, but I'm not looking at it at a, as a projection. I'm looking at it more. There's a lot more practical happening in those effects too. Well, than it's there enhancing is in this a, a practical wire. Like there's a wire yeah. there, and it's yep. enhancing that. Yeah. Whereas this basically is just a giant screen, even though it's in the form of an idol. It's just yeah. exactly. And those kind of hug the edges of like, let's say, like you know, if you're like what your your POV, if you are to sit, call that like a frame, it's like the it hugs the left and right of the frame, while your focus is the actual practical, which hit and miss sometimes nowadays of like that smoke shoot like firing out at you i guess the suspension of disbelief is better achieved i agree it's so i'm not totally against like projection but that's just like a difference in how you can like in my opinion do it the right way and then this way it's just i think that's a really good example too because mara is like right in front of you look at me yeah 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 whereas it's not a peripheral effect that's also a good point um and also we knew it was there before for fans of the ride so i wonder what newer folk who don't know that the projection is coming or what was there before what they think of it but as far as me not a big fan not totally against it but you know it doesn't ruin the ride uh wish i could have seen the sweet sweet ice i love the ice i wish they would figure out a way to do it seems pretty cool i wish the chamber room wasn't broken that's another thing uh speaking of chamber room there's a new chamber collapse scene that is basically just a giant screen right before the dart room that shit's weak (laughs) <laughs> it's, it that, looks bad man it that, looks really that, bad uh, that is on my list it's it's um, got this kind of like sheen to it it clearly is a screen well and this is kind of goes back to my point of like sometimes less is more especially you don't need that. on a ride that has so like that already proves itself with scale and incredible practical elements is it's kind of scary after you go into that massive like go through that massive glory hole sequence and then you get tucked into the dark just let it let them you know let the the senses be heightened yeah i love just traveling through the dark after that and be like oh we're we're going to scary town yeah um even like i mean i i think this is kind of uh like you know i think there's different opinions on this but like the projection of the mouse i preferred that honestly well um, they still have a version of that it's just it's now he's like getting electrocuted or something which also i have as a bad I, I there's just too much like like i don't want like lasers and lightning strikes like that are project once again it kind of takes me out of it and that sequence where honestly simply nothing just darkness yeah i mean in the, that bit was more fear inducing the the little stall in the dark with the rat projection has always been a weird part of this right even when it was the old version i've never really been the biggest fan of that part it was like we need to put something in there to get from a to b i have to imagine it has something to do with like needing space between ride vehicles would be Mm -hmm. my uh, i i can't confirm that but that would be what i think is probably happening but but at least i'd go through and be like oh gross like as opposed to like oh those are projections of lightning (laughs) (laughs) and then the last bad i have here is uh this is a sports thing the best ability is availability and this ride is constantly broken uh, you have to point it out. If we didn't, people in the comments would be like, I went to Disneyland and this thing was broken. That's a pre- very common thing to hear. For a ride that's been around for a very long time. Yes, it's 95 for this thing to They've be. They've had multiple refurbs recently and it still keeps going. Many down. mornings you go, if you rope drop, it's not even open yet. Uh, or it's just down most of the day. And Which, you know, you could take advantage of that if it's down, go over and hop on right as they reopen. But for the most part, it's kind of a daunting task to get on this bad boy. Yeah. And then even if it is working, and this is like, I guess, just piggybacking and going, just going to pluck out of one of my bads, um, like rhythm issues, even when it is functioning at certain points, the ride will just kind of stall and break momentum and you're just kind of waiting. It's rough. And yeah. So like when everything's in motion and working, like without the, you know, the stuff, especially when you stop in front of the boulder. Yeah. Have you ever had that happen? I've had that happen. Where you just, you're sitting and stalling and they're like, Okay, like uh, you're just watching Indy squirm on a rope. Yeah, feels a little yes. weird after a while. Mm-hmm. After about a minute of watching like an animatronic kind of wiggle on a rope, you're kind of like, all right, this yeah, is so a bit much. <laughs> so I'd say rhythm issues. There's um, a also I've stalled in that tunnel, that little like when you go under the boulder in that little like right turn room. I've stalled oh, yeah. in there, which completely destroys any momentum you had of a great ending. Um, but that does it for my bads. Did you guys have any more bads or nitpicks? It's not really a bad, but I think just a point to make on the critiques that we, I think we all have on the new additions that are projection heavy. Uh, a positive on that is that 
projections don't tend to break or That's cause any additional true. downtime. That's so true. if I, I am probably of the opinion that they don't need to be adding a ton to, to this ride, but if they want to do it, I can see where they're saying we can't introduce any additional problems, things that might cause additional downtime. And so if that's why they're going to go with projections, I get it, but I still want them to do it well. It's true. Cause I would add like what those randomized doors, if they don't have the rotating aspect to it, yeah. um, where, you know, at least the projections give it something actually every they, time. Whereas before it was just there. kind of like empty yeah. without it. So that's a good point. Either way, uh, that does it for the good and the bad. Let's move to the final portion of this podcast, which is the crown jewel. We're talking, of course, the uh, world-class tests. But before we do that, let's have another word from our sponsors. And we're back. Thank you for whoever sponsored this podcast. Uh, let's get into the world-class tests. Uh, this is a rubric of 10 tests painstakingly devised by Byron and myself to determine if an attraction is world-class. To receive the highly coveted world-class pass, the attraction must pass 7 out of 10 tests. A score of 6 out of 10 leaves the attraction up for debate for World Class Pass standing. And anything lower than 6 out of 10 is an automatic fail. I do not think we're going to get to that point. I would be shocked. Uh, but here's the first test. The average tourist test. Would the average tourist have a hard time getting on this ride? Is there a long wait? Is there a complicated queue system? This is trickier than I would have thought. I think so too. Because on one hand... It doesn't have that complicated of a queue system. Yes, it has Genie Plus. That's it, fine. You don't have to worry about individual lightning lane. You don't have to worry about any boarding group or anything like that. The all-time average wait time, 44 minutes, is pretty dang good considering how like iconic this attraction is. Like if you're gonna like yeah. I think nine out of ten people, if they're gonna you're gonna go like top three must do rides at Disneyland, Indiana Jones more likely than not is yes. gonna end up in that top three. Um, unless they're talking on behalf of like a very small child or here, something. Here comes the butt though. But if it is constantly resetting and an uncertainty is established where if an average tourist goes to Adventureland and it is down, are you trusting them to just keep coming and checking back throughout the day? Or... And this is a similar situation with Rise of the Resistance, I, which we passed. By I, the I way. will admit, I might, I might repent here because Rise of the Resistance is also constantly down and has a long wait. And because of it always being down, most people won't be able to get onto it. And I, I will admit, I probably should have failed that one. And so, for my favorite ride here, I'm going to just say it. I think we, I, I would fail this just because so many people aren't able to get on this ride because it's always broken. I think it's an easy fail. I mean, oh, based on the criteria, just because if we're talking about average guest, okay, they're going there for one day. If it's a first time or not a frequent, they're not going to go to this ride first. No. Most likely. Unless, unless someone has given them like the inside info, this is not where they're going to start. They're going to start with where people always start, which is Space Mountain. Or they're going to do all of that stuff or rise. Right. If, if the attraction, there were... Grading is is something that you can't guarantee reliability like after lunchtime, which is this this I, I don't think you can. Then I would have to say it's a fail. And you can't even guarantee it from the beginning. Like it's often no. this thing is closed at the beginning. And the one story you told of your son being on this ride was it breaking. So yeah. <laughs> it's pretty yep. common. Uh yep. yeah. And, and I and I told him the we were there for two days. First day we were there, he didn't do it. I did it by myself because yeah. I'm that kind of person. I left my family and I went and wrote it by myself. <laughs> um, and I was like, listen, dude, this might be your only chance because it may, it may not be working the next time we're back over at the park. So like, even the fact that I had to have that conversation it's crazy. is crazy. It's yeah. crazy. And then the next day it was up and then it ended up breaking while we were in line. But like, I had that conversation with him on our, our first day there. When I went to write it by myself, I'm like, this might be it, dude. Like, this might be your one chance. It may not be your tomorrow. All right, so that's a fail on the average tourist test. We're starting zero for one. But, you know, I don't think that's going to be a big deal. Moving on to test number two, the Leslie Stahl test. Would you be willing to wait 60 minutes for this attraction if you've already been on it at least once? Absolutely. I always say that when it comes to this test, it's like a February attraction at Disneyland was 60 minutes. Which, which would be the ones you would wait for? And this is clearly one you need to wait for. Byron, uh, what do you think about this one then? 
easy pass. I mean, I don't need to delve into it too much. It's it's worth it. You it's one it's on one of the, the big headliners of this park. I think if if it's, it's sixty minutes, like I still I still have made that decision even after you know riding it countless times throughout my life. It's if it's still you know if I'm spending a day at Disneyland and I got the you know I got sixty minutes to spare and I'm like really feeling you know Indiana Jones, which happens quite frequently. Yeah, sixty minutes and there's and this will kind of lead into the next test, I'm sure, because there's plenty to enjoy during that you know, theoretical 60 minutes that you're waiting. Also, just like drifting off the first uh, test, <laughs> this ride often is zero minutes because you can't get on it. So the fact that it's any minutes at all, like, hey, you better get in there. And, and it's and I would tell someone else that it's worth like I would do it. But also, like, I would tell just a person to say, like, it's worth an hour of your time to wait in line for it. No, so yeah, for yeah, sure. It's definitely a pass. That's a pass for the Leslie Stahl test. We're now one for two, moving on to test number three, the smartphone test. Does the queue of this ride have enough to keep you off your phone? Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, what, yeah. what can you say? Like, and it does it all of just building atmosphere. Like there's no crazy inner, like interactivity. Well, I mean, there's like the moments. It's like, yeah, like th that's like, what, like almost half to They're three little quarters gags. of the way through yeah. it. They, you know, even when even if you're waiting outside, you have like the jungle cruise going by, you're just surrounded by jungle sight lines, just incredibly well executed. Um, once you get in the temple, it's like game over because most of the time you're in there, you're like, you don't have a chance to even pull out a smartphone because you're walking through. And there's no data down there, which is great. <laughs> I, was just, I was literally waiting for it. I was gonna be like, do do phones even work in the queue? Like, yeah. I don't think my i think i mean i have Verizon. <laughs> i think the the last time i was there when i rode by myself left my family uh i tried to let them know where i was in the queue and it, there was no letting them know and there was no signal so. it's not gonna happen no i mean i like i this is definitely one of the biggest passes i'll ever yeah. give to Re this really takes you back to the 1930s i like that you can't go on your phone and i don't think i would want to anyway like this mm -hmm. is in my opinion, one of the top three queues in the world. The details it may not insane. be the most advanced, but the atmosphere that you're in and the storytelling that it does from the very beginning to the end, you have there's almost zero chance you could go through this queue and not have an idea of what is about to happen. Um, and if you're a fan of the films, plenty of Easter eggs, half a mile of queue here. You could make the argument it started Disney's kind of like foray into making queues part of the uh, actual attraction. The experience starts when you enter the line. I would say this is probably the first ride to really lean into that. Um, yeah, it's fantastic. I think this is a pass. Pass all around. Easy. Yep. Sweet. Moving on. That's two for three. Moving on to test number four, the Tony Stark test. How innovative is this attraction? Does it push theme park tech forward? The ride system on this was the first of its kind. So that alone makes this a pass. But Yeah, and who knows what other sort of, you know, revolutionary. Well, I, like I things. said, it revolutionized cues. So yeah. you could make the argument there. A lot of the practical effects on here probably push theme park tech forward in some way or another, but the ride system in general is it makes it an automatic pass in my eyes. Yep. All the randomized features, like it was the first to use ice and then stop <laughs> using ice. That's <laughs> true. It can't have been first, but I mean it's use of like just real things like the fire. Yes. Like, I don't know if it was first or one of the first, but there's there's so much about it that um, it feels like when they were tasked with coming up with this attraction, they had someone, you know, telling uh, everyone yes to everything. And that's kind of why we got such a, uh, an awesome attraction. So I feel like it pushed forward the tech and also just kind of like set a new bar for what what you can do. In a, in a ride like that. And Disney needed a thrill ride that was also a dark ride because to this point, they really had not done it that well. Uh, yeah. This feels like the best version of that. So Yeah. And you could say it did take theme park tech forward. <clears throat> Even if this ride system is, you know, not really replicated today, probably because it is so complicated to uphold, they had to think of new and innovative ways going forward to give like, you know, a very unique experience. You can't just exactly. do an Omni mover. Or, like everyone's now looking for the next bigger and better way to move you through an, uh, an experience. Maybe we'll see some and, of that at Epic Universe. We'll see. Yeah. So I think it started here. Uh, so that's a pass. Three for four. Moving to test number five, the Hollywood test. Can this attraction be adapted for the silver screen? Does it have a comprehensible story? It was adapted from the screen and 
even this attraction alone has its own insular story. So yeah, once again, easy pass here. Solace explains the whole thing in yeah. Eyes on the Globe. Temple of the Forbidden Eye. You get your own, it's your, yeah, your own unique Indiana Jones experience. And one of the few rides that has like a very finite, uh, fully realized ending. A lot of rides, it kind of just is like, oh, I guess that's it. Whereas this, it's like you have a true ending in that you escape this boulder, you see the boulder after. It's fantastic. Uh, Scott, thoughts on this, or do you, is it a pass as well? Oh, yeah. Give me, give me the Haunted Mansion film version of this uh, that we saw oh, last yeah. summer. Like, just, you know, that, that, would be, that would be awesome. <laughs> I would like to see an indie version of this. I guess it would be kind of like Temple, but, you know, whatever. A little bit. I think like a lot of the vibe was taken from Temple. Yeah, I mean, it had the consulting screenwriters, so yeah. it makes sense. Uh, four for five. Moving on to test number six, the Simpson test. How likely is this to be replaced with something new? A la Back to the Future with the Simpsons, which we mourn every day. Uh, boy, I, I'd like to think that this would never be replaced specifically because they just released an indie film. However, that indie film performed poorly at the box office, but this attraction is so well liked and so legendary that I find it hard to believe they replace it, but you never know with IP rides. It feels like they're doing the opposite. They, they discuss potentially bringing it to animal kingdom. Yeah, it is be, it is potentially going to be the Simpson and, and potentially replace dinosaurs. <laughs> so I don't think they have any intentions of removing ours. And oh God, the scale of it, that would be such a pain in the ass. And I think it would be so expensive to replace it with anything else. Well, Scott, you have a pretty and, good finger on the pulse of Disney culture and just like more corporate speak. Do you could you see a world in which they move on from this IP and take it out of Disneyland? I don't know. I, I, I think it would be the least likely ride to ever get that treatment. Like, I think they would, they would go crazy and like completely change the Jungle Cruise before it would make sense for them to change Indeed. this ride. Just yeah. because everything is so specific to the IP that inspired them to build the attraction, it just feels like it would be the attraction has all the issues that we've mentioned with being reliable. Like, it it, if they were going to retheme it, it seems like they would be better off just to start something new. And I, I just don't know what Disney would crank out that they would ever see as being, oh, no. you know, a fit in something like that. Like even just as a, you know, as a storybook, like how would that attraction, like what would the story be that Disney would come out with that they would feel like would better fit that attraction? Than Indiana Jones, and if they still haven't taken Aerosmith out of Rock and Roller Coaster at Walt Disney, World, <laughs> I'd say the chances yeah. are low. <laughs> How about some backstage passes? Uh, the thing about uh, the Indy ride as well, Indiana Jones Adventure, is it's one of the few IP rides in any Disney park that doesn't even feel like an IP ride. It feels intrinsically part of Disneyland's DNA. Whereas, like Star Wars stuff, I still kind of feel like, oh, I'm in a Star Wars land. It doesn't feel very. And I know it's newer. But even like Star Tours has always felt a little odd to me, whereas just Indy has felt it feels like part of Disneyland, like it's always been there. And I, I, f I find that to be odd, even though it's an IP thing. Maybe it's because I love Dr. Jones so much, but uh, yeah. OK, I think this is a pass. I'm going to pass it. Easy pass. All right. Moving on. Five for six. Uh, moving on to test number seven, the signature moment test. Can this ride hold its own without its signature moment? Is it a one trick pony? Uh, no. I withheld this thought earlier oh, when no. we were talking about the boulder. No, 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 oh, no. Oh, no. okay. I was about don't, to say. Don't, it's not going that way. It's because I didn't want to bring it up too early. But when we were talking about you know, the boulder being the best finale and how it feels like the nostalgia there is earned, it's because you already felt like you got an, a complete experience before, as Scott said, the massive cherry on top yes. gets dumped on you where the finale is that good because you already felt like you were fulfilled prior to even getting to it. So if you removed it, it would still I it would still be an incredible attraction, I think. No, cuz you could say the signature moments if you want to lay them out on the table. We have uh the reveal of the glory hole room as Scott was saying on you're on that bridge and you see the scale, your interaction with the snake, perhaps the dart room and then the boulder. I mean, those are all four very different 
Uh, you, you pluck any of them out and you already you just you would just jump to the next one is oh that's a signature moment that's a signature moment no for sure and let's be honest the boulder is often not working and i'm still like that was a great ride so now when i get yep. the boulder i was like oh yeah we got the ball yep i mean the only way this could possibly be a no and this would be the ride uh pulling an operation and changing the track is if it just t- took a left and we didn't even go into the big reveal room. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, if we just, the track broke, and we somehow skipped the snake and all of that. That's the only way that I could maybe think that you take away something and it would, you know, the ride wouldn't be the same. But you I mean, just like, go Indiana Jones VIP lounge. You know. Right. <laughs> but, e- but even, like, even in the, you know, if the fire effects are not working, like, there's, there's so many things that you could take out, and it's still uh, uh, amazing. I think... Rise of the Resistance is pretty much the same. I would say I would describe it the same way. Yeah, um, yeah. Because there's so many things throughout that ride. If you take out a few, it, it, it's not as good. You know, yeah. if the, the finale with Kylo is, if he's behind a wall and they yeah. have to put him up on the screen, like it's not as good. But there's still like four or five things throughout that you would point to. Um, but yeah, this one, it has so much going on that. It's it stands alone. I agree. Pass, pass, pass. Moving on. Six for seven. I mean, this is kind of going how I thought. But before we get into the last three tests to see how high this bad boy flies, because we're already in debate land, uh, let's take another word to thank our sponsors. And we are back. Thank you for that. Test number eight. We are now at six for seven. Let's try and immediately cement this as a world class attraction. The premature detraculation test. Does this ride finish too soon? <laughs> so, so child. <laughs> it's a great name. It's, it's, it's the worst. Uh, no, I, I think this ride is perfectly paced. It's the perfect length. I, I just don't, I, I don't ever feel like I was cheated. And that's partially because of like the great first, second, third act structure that it actually has. But, um, you know, three and a half minutes. I've seen some accounts saying it's a little longer than that. That's a long amount of time for a ride. That is so jam-packed. Yes. With what it's got. No dead air. Other than that one part that's literally dead air where you kind of stall. <laughs> but um, no, I, I, I think this is a perfectly paced ride. I think this is another easy pass for me. Pass for me. Easy pass. Yep. No, it's, it's, it's the right amount of time. We'd always like these attractions to be longer, but I mean, it, I feel like it's, um, you don't have half of an, uh, the, the, attraction runtime dedicated to a lift hill or, or some no. some just yes. dead you know i know you, you said dead space but like that's that's exactly that there's none of that you go straight into it so so, so many scenes yeah an incredible and, amount of scenes and it feels like you're just covering so much land it, it feels like you're going through an entire temple no it's worth it uh so easy pass seven for eight there it is automatically a world-class attraction uh, oh, I guess we're going to clap for that. But uh, uh, now we could see how high this bad boy is going to climb. Let's keep going. Test number nine, the exit hall test. Do you see people be physically excited getting off of this ride? Do they have that bounce in their step after this ride? It's a half mile bounce. Yeah, I, I've seen people pretty stoked and uh, sometimes they're laughing. I've been on a couple times where people clap and not the kind of clap that you see over at Universal where they make you clap. It's a, an actual, a legit clap. <laughs> And people are stoked. Like, I, I often hear people in these caves just saying, wow, that was so cool. And being surprised by it, because this is an older IP to even, like, a, a lot of generations. And people are surprised there's an Indiana Jones attraction if they don't know Disneyland. And a lot of Gen Z folk are like, who's Indiana Jones? And then the MTV generation tells them. That's yes, exactly. that's right. That is right. Uh, but no, I think, I think there's plenty of bounce in people's steps. Last time I rode this, like a week or two ago, I like went on it in the morning and I do remember just getting off and making that long walk back up and thinking like I was by myself, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> but I recall it was just everything was firing on all cylinders. That's not always the case. It happened to be the case that morning. And I remember thinking like today rules. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's a great way to just carry you throughout the rest of the day. Uh, what do you think, Scott? This one, have you seen people just be pretty stoked after this ride? Oh yeah. Oh, like when you immediately get off, I feel like there's kind of this, like you, um, especially I mean, you can tell when someone's writing for the first time, but even, oh, yeah. you know, regulars, there's kind of like that moment of eye contact where it's just like, wow, that was awesome. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I will say, though, 
uh, that excitement has kind of worn off when people realize how long they have to walk back to get back to the park. By the time you get to the end, you're kind of like, oh, wow. Okay, that was was a haul. It was fun. But, man, that's a walk. You Uh, get your steps in for sure. All right, that's a pass. We're now at eight for nine. Moving on to the last test, test number 10, uh, the fine wine test. Has this attraction aged well? Has your opinion of the attraction appreciated or depreciated since your first experience? Or if it's a new ride, do you believe it will age well? You always have to debate, you know, how much will functionality overcome the emotional relevance? And so for me, because like I was initially like first thought, I was like, well, it does have its technical issues and those happen often. But then again, this attraction has always been a victim of that. Yeah. Um, and what I've kind of started leaning to recently, especially upon recent rides, and maybe I'm swayed off just everything was working and <laughs> fluid the last time I rode it. Yeah. Where it kind of harkened back to like the earlier experiences of riding it for me, where I, I just got off it thinking, you know, there are so many things in this ride that they still can't pull off today. Yeah. And yeah. for a ride that was made in 1995, to still feel ahead of its time exactly. is mind-blowing. As a little kid riding it, you're so immersed in what's happening. You just don't think about it in the ways we think about it now. I wasn't like riding like, this is like a state-of-the-art ride that's doing things that have never been done before and won't be done for a long time. And with that comes building appreciation where the longer we go through, you know, all these new innovative stuff, like things that are coming out, the fact that it still holds up and has pieces of it that can't be done today that were done in 1995, I think warrants a pass. Scott, what do you think? Has this? Yep. No, I, I don't think they are trying as much as I think they should and, and maybe would want them to. I don't think they're trying to build attractions at the type of scale that they went into this one saying that they wanted to go in and build. Uh, and for that reason, I think it'll hold up in the same way that um, like pirates and other rides have held up for not only nostalgia, but just like it was the approach to attractions at that time. And I feel like Indy is kind of like a snapshot in time for that, too, like pulling off all the things that we talked about. But um, the only caveat I would have, as long as it continues to get support, financially supported for maintenance and yes. keeping it, you know, uh, operating. I don't see it being a ride that will ever significantly change. People will always be thrilled with this ride. No, for sure. And I think the maintenance thing is it's always had issues from the beginning. So like it breaking down, that's always been the case, even from like the early days. So like the fact that it still does that, but then the, there's days that where it works great. That plays into this a little bit, but honestly, it's my favorite ride. I look forward to getting on this ride the most out of any ride at Disneyland every time I go. Uh, and every time, like Byron said, I find new details and a new appreciation for it. And the uh, use of practical effects always ages well, in my opinion, even if you have to spend a little bit more on maintenance. So that one's going to be a pass for all of us, it seems like. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Now that does it for the world-class test. That gives it a final score of 9 out of 10. We're, I guess we'll clap. <laughs> yeah, second clap. Yeah. Uh, congratulations, <laughs> Indiana Jones Adventure. You are a world-class attraction. It gets that world-class pass. Uh, but that does it for this episode. Thank you for joining us, Scott. Appreciate you taking the time to talk Indiana Jones Adventure, my favorite ride of all time, and it uh, seems like be one of yours as well. Um, do you have anything you'd like to plug here before we depart? Everyone keep enjoying consuming what I would say Disney Parks outlets podcasts like this one that are <laughs> not uh, rage baiting and uh, click baiting and all that stuff just support like good solid um, parks outlets I don't need you to do anything for me just support the people that are doing it right no doubling down on what Scott said and like I said up at the top Scott is is you know at the forefront of actual facts being presented in the theme park industry which is rare on the internet nowadays so if you need anything confirmed you know where to go and what is your handle scott so people could follow you uh scott gustin yep g-u-s-t-i-n yep uh well thank you for everything you do thanks for coming on to the show and thank you to all you who watched and listened to this episode if you watched make sure you like and subscribe once again it helps keep us 
doing this because spoiler alert this is not a financially viable podcast at the <laughs> moment and then uh, as for those listening make sure you subscribe and rate the podcast that also helps us uh keep going here uh you can follow us at F- fya pod on all the socials i'm at ryan s Bergara on x and at ryan Bergara on instagram and byron is at byron a marin on all the socials but until next time we'll see you guys later thanks for watching and listening bye-bye Thank you.